Well, hello and welcome to episode number 338 of the Plain Talking UK podcast. I'm Carlos and in this week's show, Exeter's old flyby base has some new residents. An airline in Asia goes uh, gender neutral with their passenger greetings and paramedics in the Lake District begin tests with their new emergency vehicle. In the military news this week, a US Marine Corps KC-135 and an F-35 collide during an air-to-air refueling and in Paris, a sonic boom brings the city to a halt. In the last part of Nick's chat with Ian Palmer this week and we talk to Gemma Brazier about her time as a cabin crew and an exciting new project she's been working on to help fellow crew during literally the worst year in aviation history. So joining me this week as always in the master headquarters of where everything happens for the PTUK show is of course Matt Smith. It's that classic joke isn't it? Yes, is he pre- he, yes he's, press- he's pressing all the, all the same but not necessarily in the right order. That's the- <laughs> There we go. Hello Carlos, how are you? I'm very well, Matt, and um, I'm safe to say, can I say, how's the cheese going? Uh, yes, uh, sl- slowly working my way through the um, the Red Cross parcel that I received a couple of days ago. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, the, the cake was yeah, okay. I've, I've had better, yeah. I'll be honest. It was a bit dry, yeah. but that's the co-op for you, I suppose. Uh, anyway, yes, there we are. No, yeah, all very well. Thank you. Yes, what have you been up to this week? Uh, I've had a week off. I've been. I've had a, a very rare week off. Oh at yes, because somebody was supposed to have gone to Malta. And if we, uh, yes, up, yeah. I would have been flying back <laughs> from Malta yesterday with uh, with EasyJet, but obviously that. Didn't oh, so happen. I would have spent most of today cleaning then, essentially. Yes, God, yes, because because you're on the way back. Yes. So rather than uh, rather than cancel my week's booked holiday, I had a week at home here in the beautiful English weather. Say no more, and um, <laughs> done lots of household old chores as we all do. But mm. um, yeah, it's been a good week. It's been a good week anyway. But you may have noticed, guys and girls who are watching, that we have no Nev with us this week. Unfortunately, Nev is busy. I think he's uh, um, somewhere in Europe at the moment. I think, isn't he? In Sweden. Sweden, yeah, Sweden. Yes, yeah, in absolutely. Sweden, yeah. So uh, Nev, if you're watching or listening, or may not be watching or listening, he's probably. He's in, he's in the uh, he's in the PTUK uh, group chat at the moment, sending uh, okay. terribly inappropriate jokes. Uh, oh, so. okay. <laughs> Fine. Thank you, Nev. And miss, beautiful miss pictures you. of Sweden. Indeed. Indeed, yes, I would read you out the joke, but we'd be taken off air almost immediately, so that's not going to happen. Actually, can I just say, <laughs> thanks to a trip I took on Monday to IKEA, I do have a piece of Sweden in the freezer outside. I, 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 w- w- okay, you need Meatballs. to clarify that. Hang on. You, you well have... done, Amanda. Meatballs. Meatballs. That's the only reason everybody goes to IKEA. <laughs> really? I thought, it, I thought it was that. Was it? I thought it was their high quality furniture is why everybody went. To oh yeah, we we brought some of that as well. Yeah, but right. Um, okay. But I thought yeah. you did that a couple of weeks ago. Uh, well, we had to go back. Oh, did you? Right. At- yeah. <laughs> Okay. So yeah. well, appara- us- apparently we, we, we told to stop talking about IKEA and move Sorry. on in our ears. By the way, I should stress. Uh- so back back with us this week, as always, by popular demand it is of course the absolute awesome legend that is. And thanks for the hat. It is Armando. Hello. Back by popular demand from the listeners, not by contract though, because as you can tell. Nev and I cannot be on no. the same show yeah, more than I think sixteen times per year is what we settled is on. It? So. Oh, I thought it was as low as five, so that's 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 more promising than I hoped. Yeah. Well, we re- we renegotiated our contract with HR. So. Right, good, lovely. Yeah, and how was HR? Who is HR? Just out of interest. <laughs> <laughs> right, is that is, yeah, that, is, that, is that Poppy? Like is know. that Poppy Cat? Is it? You got to have a chat with the cat, have you, to, to sort of negotiate contracts? Oh dear. Yeah, that Everyone. sounds exactly what I do every morning. Indeed. Have a chat with the cat. Um, <laughs> okay. I wonder why this computer switched on every morning when I come in here. Okay, anyway, moving on. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so this week uh, we have got a very special guest joining us indeed, and uh, we were going to welcome onto the show for her first time on the show. And it's Probably always great last, to have you. And at last, yeah. <laughs> But uh, it's always good to have uh, some cabin crew on the show uh, to talk about their experiences and also something that uh, she's also done to help all those affected by what's going on. But uh, we're going to welcome onto the show Gemma Brazier. Hello, Gemma. Hi, how are you? Very well, Gemma. <laughs> how, how, how are things uh, with you? Because you are in a very, very pleasant part of the UK, aren't you? I am. I live in Poole in Dorset, so I'm literally about 100 yards from the water, which is lovely. So I'm oh. very lucky. Uh, maybe not so much when the weather's like it has been this week, perhaps. Maybe less appealing no, than normal. Time. 
bright. We had such beautiful weather. So we were, we were really lucky. I was able to walk around the park with the girls every day. So we didn't, um, we didn't kind of suffer too much being in lockdown. So we are very, very blessed to live here. Wow. Uh, now, Jamie, you've had an awesome career uh, with uh, Virgin Atlantic. We can say that on, uh, on this show. Um, but you've also got a project going on as well, uh, which we're going to talk about with you in just a bit. So we're going to have a good chat with you uh, in a few moments. But we are going to say a quick uh, thank you to everyone who has joined us in the live YouTube chat room this evening. All the usual family members in there, including, uh, let's have a look and see who we've got in there tonight. We've got uh, Captain Cruz, Sturman, Alan Loveday, Masher's in there, Auntie Liz, uh, Paul Tricker is in the chat room as well, uh, Graham Haley, uh, Armando, is obviously good to have Armando in there with the blue spanner uh, of death. Uh, Tony S, hello to you, Tony. Lane Street as well is in the chat room. Uh, hello to you, Myla. If I've missed you one out, guys, no, no, I think I've missed you one out. And to everyone else who's uh, who I might have missed out and was watching, a big welcome to you this week. And don't forget as well, if you are listening to the audio show uh, on iTunes or one of the other platforms, don't forget to head over to YouTube and uh, hit the subscribe button and the bell icon, which is right next door to that, to be notified when we go live on YouTube on a Friday night. And you can then join us in the chat room and have a damn good old chin wag with some people in there, which is always good to do but uh, we have got a bit of housework to do at the start of the show this week haven't we mr smith we certainly have yes it's it's patreon time ladies and gentlemen it's the uh, moment where we basically say thank you to the wonderful people who help pay for what uh, what we do each week so uh, carlos i think you've got a nice little list of of names there and especially uh, given what's been going on lately we are so so grateful that you continue so. uh, to support us in what is frankly ridiculous times so uh, uh, from the bottom of our hearts thank you very much and the full list is as follows so a huge thanks to everyone here then so Nicholas Codling thank you to you Warren Dixon Louis Ca Caceres I've got that one right Alan <laughs> probably Lundy, not <laughs> uh, Alan Loveday Andrew van der Sag Alan White Stephen Howland Tanya Wyman Megan Carrion uh, Jacob Darlington Brown Nicholas Hewitt Masher uh, and uh, Mr. Owen Shimizu, thank you to you as well. Uh, Ruben Wells, Nico Reiger, uh, Graham Haley, Jonathan Warner, Eric Graves, Matt Caton, Jordan Rose, Andrew Wilson, Captain Jeff, uh, Adam Spink, Liz Piper, Jeff Ward, Myla, Evan Shu, Philip Lave, Shut Backer, Ray Williams, Stephanie Plummer, and also our PayPal donators who uh, make uh, a donation through the PayPal link on our website. Richard Adams, thanks to you. Tony Stubbings, Jennifer Parkinson, and Mazus Kareem. Thank you to you one and all. And thanks to everyone who helps to, uh, to push the show forward each month. We do very much appreciate your help each month with uh, keeping things moving in the studios, don't we? Absolutely, yes. Yes, it's... Um... I say it was so grateful as I say especially in the, these very very strange times so uh, we would have been completely understanding if uh, people were not able to help us out at the moment but uh, as I say it, it means even more to us in these very strange times it certainly does so thanks everyone and uh, yeah we'll keep producing as long as we can so we're going to move on with the next part of the show then and we're going to have a good chat now with our special guest this evening Gemma so Gemma welcome again onto the show thanks for taking time out of your Friday evening uh, to join us on here and it's a bit a uh, bit sort of a bit, a bit daunting I think for some time with your it's your first time uh, on a podcast but uh, actually I think Gemma do you do you appear on a podcast as well yourself yeah uh, we have um, a not just crew podcast that we've got on Facebook so I talked um, on there at the end of August about um, the project that I'm working on so yeah that was my first little taster so I'm kind of getting a little bit used to it now but thank you for having me yeah thank you for coming join us that's good so we're gonna have a chat really I suppose uh, Gemma about where kind of things started for you then within the industry you know where did um, did you kind of was it a leaving school leaving college and going straight into the the aviation industry how did things no, so I, I, um, I left school at 16 and I went to work for an electricity board. So I worked at people's electricity bills as soon as I left school. Um, and then I went to work for Plymouth City Council. I was in their um, legal department. So I was working there as a clerk. Um, and my friend was a beauty therapist and she used to work, well, she was older than me. So she started at Virgin um, before I did. And she used to do all the beauty therapy treatments in upper class. 
Um, and she just used to say, you're going to love it. You need to come and work. As soon as you're 19, you need to apply. So, um, yeah, when I was 19, I applied for Virgin and I got the job. Uh, I only thought I'd do it for about a year and then possibly like go back to Plymouth and do something else. But 20 years later, I was still there. Um, how, did, how did you find the training, Jane? <laughs> The whole the kind of thing. Oh, training it was daunting. I was nineteen, so it was a massive change for me. I was I'd lived in Plymouth all my life, and then all of a sudden I was living in Crawley. Um, so yeah, it was it was a lot of information. It was it was very intense for six weeks. I have to say, I'd never come from obviously any aviation background. The language was different. I didn't. My only experience was going on my holiday. So um, yeah, I wasn't ever um, infatuated with planes. I'd never had a massive desire to, um, to be cabin crew, but I did love to travel and I loved um, exploring and seeing different places. So this was kind of my route to be able to do that. And, I, and like I said, I was only planning on doing it for a year, um, but it's just, it was, it's a lifestyle. It's so addictive. And you, and you just, when you're there, you just don't imagine doing anything else. Wow. So I, I was going to say, actually, went with the whole, the whole training and aside kind of thing, was there anything... I know you say you, the, the kind of interest in the flying, the avia, the aircraft side of things, but would you say that over the years you've picked up kind of bits about the aircraft and the operating oh, yeah. systems? Yeah, absolutely. It's still my, um, the 747 is still my favourite aircraft to work on. It was um, the first, uh, the 747-200s that I always remember, it's Cat and Rum, and we still had those. And the, upstairs, the, the jump seat was outside the flight deck. And you saw the whole um, slide and everything. It was it was raw like raw flying for me at the time because it's become so advanced now. Obviously, twenty years later, the technology and um, even like the in the interior of the aircraft, it's it's so different. It's so much further along. But back then, twenty years ago, it was it was very very different. And yeah, I never thought that I would know so much about aircraft um, as much as I do. But when you first started, because the training was, like I said, so intense, you were so um, in kind of engulfed in the safety procedures, the, the first aid training, all of the AVMED, um, and kind of the service bit came a little bit later on. You didn't really get used to all of the service side of flying until you were well into your um, sort of into your six months, because trying to get your head around everything, as well as all of the safety, that was always kind of drilled into you in your training, you are there for safety primarily. So the service, you kind of eased your way into when you actually did get on board the aircraft. Um, but yeah, I, I loved it. I loved my training. Everyone I everyone I trained with, I'm still friends with now. So I wouldn't have changed it for the world. I think that, that's quite common actually, I think, isn't it? I mean, a lot of people, when you're all thrown in at the deep end, I mean, I think in any industry, isn't it? It's where you're all thrown in at the deep end together, if you like, and you're going through your training and then you sort of develop friendships and things that quite often stay with you for life, um, you know, yeah, off absolutely. the back of that. Yeah, they, they have become my best friends and, um, and yeah, you, you don't imagine doing anything else when you're all together. You don't know any different. I didn't know any different because I hadn't come from another airline. Um, there was a few people on my course at the time who had flown before, but like I said, I'd never, it was all new to me. Um, so I kind of didn't know any difference. So I just took it all on board. And I think I was still relatively quite young out of, of the school environment. So I was able to absorb it and get used to the, the lessons every day, the sort of teachings. And I, I did kind of take it, not, not, I didn't find it easy, but I did, I was able like a bit of a sponge to absorb all you, of you the information. Of, still in what I call like learning mode, if you like, because yeah, you just come fresh probably, from school. I kind of had been swayed by another airline so I didn't have all of that information in the back of my head I only knew what Virgin were teaching me and their yeah. procedures so I was able to kind of take that quite quickly and and you I've like yeah like I say you use it all the way through your career so I, I luckily I wasn't um swayed by any other airlines teaching no. uh, actually uh, Captain Cruz uh, has got a comment in the chat room that says wow 20 years at Virgin did they accept Gemma at the age of five uh, <laughs> well, I <wish. laughs> Oh, well, dear. sadly, I am. I'm forty now. No, so. don't, don't, don't say. You're not supposed to say that out loud. Oh no! I don't <laughs> Actually, Jimmy, you say the seven four seven. Was there any other aircraft you flew while you were with them um, on Virgin? Um, yeah, I was on the A three forties, the six hundreds. Um, I was on uh, the seven four. Oh, sorry, the seven eight sevens. We we've just got those. So. I kind of, 747 was always my little baby. I just loved, I loved flying on that because um, Vegas was my preferred route. So oh, it wow. was always on that, it was always on the aircraft. So I became so familiar with it. Um, and back in my early sort of flying career, I was always off to Orlando. 
Um, and, and, we, and we had a lot of those aircraft. So most, a lot of our routes were on that. And you had to do a year on the, a year's flying before you got trained on the Airbus. So you, you kind of honed your skills, as I would say, on, on the 747 before you were allowed to go on the Airbus. Wow. Um, and do the, the Shanghai, Hong Kongs, all the sort of Far East routes. You didn't. You kind of almost got promoted to those kind of routes until you'd honed your craft on the seven eight. Sorry, the seven four seven. So, but yeah, then I fell in love with the seven eight as soon as that came. So it was a, such a dream to work on, especially in the back galley. It was such a luxury having all the space. So it was yeah, it was incredible. It was you we just weren't used to used to having that much space in the back galley and and yeah, it was all new. It was all fresh, you know, brand new. So it was yeah, it's exciting when you've been with an airline that long. You do see all the changes and all the of the advancements. But um, yeah, it was um, when we had the six hundreds as well. I remember having our training day in the hangar, and even that was all like brand spanking new, and you could smell the carpets and. <laughs> One of those little things that were really exciting um, because I was still like, I was still like, I think I was 20 when we got the 600s. It was still all so new. Um, so yeah, it was, it was just really exciting. It is still really exciting. I love all of the of advancements in aviation, the new suites that we got. Um, even now on the, on the new Airbuses, the A350s, all of the configurations inside the brand new suites we have on there. It's, it's exciting to have change, I think. As you, um, you were mentioning uh, layovers there, actually, and uh, one of the things that you saying that you mentioned Vegas um, uh, and uh, Orlando and that, but uh, Lane Street is actually asking, uh, do you actually have a favourite layover spot? Where where was the place you most loved to go? Vegas. Oh, it was Vegas. <laughs> yeah. Do, do, I mean, do, how long were your layovers? Because I know it depends airline to airline as to how long you're in 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 each uh, uh, on each layover. I mean, how long did you usually get in Vegas? So on the east coast you'd have one night and then on the west coast you would have two nights um sometimes in the winter like in the winter schedule when it would change um vegas was my second ever trip when oh, we wow. first started flying there so um it was five nights then they were lovely so, Wait, so wow. you were so you were 19 years old in las vegas so i assumed that they wouldn't I serve think. you alcohol right <laughs> no of course not <laughs> um, yeah after all we have ways and means <laughs> but, um, we do like a little drink when we've got down route but um and no they it was just it, it was amazing it was um those even in the winters even up into last year we were having three night vegases um and it was just depending on on what schedules they had going up what time um most of the far east ones were all two nights but it was just so lovely to have that time there you'd have time to explore um uh, and, and and rest really because those far east ones are really really tiring mm. when you go to hong kong and when we used to fly to narita they were tiring as well so um we used to all go out to a place called the truck and a lot of british airways crew were there as well and they know how to party <laughs> <laughs> you, you say vegas is, is your favorite Gemma. is there any destinations that that, that would come up and you would think oh no not again Not really, because I because as you went on, you were able to request um, a specific route or a flight that you wanted to do every month, or you could have a preference. So I had a West Coast preference because I loved my Vegas's or my LA. I do I do love a like a Shanghai. I love going to Shanghai. I love going to Hong Kong. Um, and this it was very flexible. You were able to swap with each other. So if you were able to mutually swap with another crew member, you could kind of in a way build your little roster, but. I was happy to go anywhere because I just I loved the change and I loved exploring and I, there wasn't any routes that we had that I, re I really never wanted to go to. Armando. Yeah, I actually wanted to go back to the Dreamliner. So we've had people on the show, we've had listeners that have submitted, hey, here was my experience on the Dreamliner, but I never thought about this first from a cabin crew perspective that you're you're flying across the ocean a couple of times a month in it. So all the advances and the environmentals did that? Did you feel like that made a difference for you, and and how tired you were, or how jet lagged you were? No. <laughs> you used to feel so different getting off. But it, I, I, to be fair, I never really noticed a massive difference. Um, if if I'm brutally honest, I just like the environment that we were working in. So I guess it didn't feel as much of a hard work having the galley space because even up the front. We, we, because we also used to working on the 747, you had the double galley at the back. So moving the carts around, everything was that little bit more hard work. 
whereas in the in the back you it didn't it wasn't physically as demanding than having to to get the service out into the cabin um with regards to like the air and things like that i guess i i probably didn't notice and uh, some crew might have i personally i didn't but i think i probably didn't feel as physically tired just purely because of having to move everything around in the galleys for 10 hours it wasn't as physically draining yeah that so, makes sense we've got so a question lovely and so we've got a question from someone in the chat room, uh, Gemma, for you. And this one's from Graham Haley. Graham's asking, how annoying is it to see passengers ignoring safety announcements? Um, I, get, I guess it's human nature, um, because if they fly regularly, they do end up hearing the same thing from every airline in the safety. Um, but that is why we're there. I and mean, we have had very intensive training. We do have to go back every year and resit our exams. Um, and we do take it very, very seriously as cabin crew. So yes, when you are saying to somebody that they can't, um, they can't sleep on the floor, or they must put their baby back um, onto their lap in their um, infant extension seat, but they can't stay in the cot. Um, and I, and I, and I'm a mum as well, so I understand even those little things. You don't want to wake your child, but I have also seen videos of decompressions where people have hit the ceiling. So. I think as you, you get that sort of privileged other side of, of aviation and flying and you're very, very aware that things can happen at the drop of a hat. As much as you try and avoid turbulence or anything like that, you still just don't know if, if it could ever happen at any time. So we are still like, we would always be very, very self-conscious and, and it can be frustrating at times, but at the end of the day, you are there to ensure that the procedures are followed and should you just educate i guess that's the only way i can describe it you would just be there to educate and hopefully at the end of the day if they don't comply um there are consequences to that as well i guess armando we've got yeah. a question from tony haven't we well actually i wanted to ask one first mm. the yeah uh, I, we've had a lot of people a lot of our family members in the podcast community are, are pilots and they're airline pilots and i think there's there would be no doubt that an experienced cabin crew member in the in the back of the airplane is just incredibly indispensable especially when you can't see anything back there there's so much there's so much happening in the last you know 90 percent of the airplane have you ever had to put some of that training into use or have a sort of a harrowing experience or something where, where you had to um, you know kind of put that training yeah, you, you, well, you, you are very aware that you're the eyes and ears of the flight deck. They can't get down the back to see what's going on. Um, I've always said to my crew um, when we've had briefings, even the simple, the simple kind of process of de-icing the wings, you always need to be really vigilant because within that hour turnaround, if it starts to get, especially in JFK, because sometimes you have a really long taxi, um, so you have to be really aware even with, with simple things like that. But yes, I've also had... We also got struck by lightning on a flight to Cape Town. <laughs> so that was a new experience. And you, they're, they're very open. The great thing that I found working at Virgin was everyone had a really open attitude. There was no kind of egos. You were able to openly and freely speak to the flight deck, um, even from cabin crew up to onboard managers like myself. You never felt that you weren't able to directly contact them. So it was great that we did have that open um, environment to work in but yeah there's, there has been occasions where I've had to get the flight deck I've had to get the captain like out on boarding with something that I found suspicious um, and I needed clarification because I wasn't happy to take a certain customer um, because of his behavior um, I obviously flew I was a, I was still flying post 9-11 so that that was a very heightened time in aviation for everybody um, so there was a lot more communication there with the flight deck so you weren't always sure of a situation, but I think then it was a learning curve for everybody. Um, and we've come on leaps and bounds since then where you kind of have that open and honest um, communication with them, which is great. That, and that's what you need. You need to be able to trust that your cabin crew are reporting incidents in the cabin and, and that your flight deck are open to listening to you. Yeah, I'm very glad you've had that experience because it, it didn't used to be that way, not even 10 years ago, I don't think. I think crew resource management has come a long way in including the cabin crew. I think, is, was it Ke Kedworth? That was a massive um, sort of aviation learning experience where they shut down the wrong engine because they didn't listen to the cabin crew. Um, mm -hmm. So I think hopefully that we've possibly come on leaps and bounds since then. And hopefully in the last 10 years, like you've said, that we have 
um, evolved still. I think communication is is always a two way street. Sometimes back in the olden days, I think with with the flight deck, especially if they were ex military, it was very um, it was very stern and it was kind of very hierarchy set. So you felt that maybe these the personalities that you're dealing with, they're used to deal, dealing with kind of rank order. So um, hopefully that's been sort of phased out slightly and, and the flight deck captains and first officers are, are more open to listening to the cabin crew because obviously we want that aircraft to be just as safe as they do. Mm. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Absolutely. Uh, just... Well, uh, uh, Tony, Tony in the in the chat room has got a a great question here. You were sort of talking about uh, that the sort of like p behavior and and things like that. He was saying that uh, what's the se what's your secret for dealing with rude and disruptive mm. passengers? Um, I take on, I just take it on board what they're saying is on on board an aircraft and with the procedures that you're set by your company, you are, you can only do so much. Um, obviously, with the Vegases that I do, I am used to disruptive passengers and um, on a couple of, well, a fair few occasions, I have had the authorities meet the aircraft when we get them. Um, oh, wow. I am very good friends with the station manager in Vegas now. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that tells its own story. Uh <laughs> we have, yeah, I give you a whole programme on Vegas. But, um, yeah, that's for another programme. Lovely. All right, well, when we, when, we do a, when we do a sort of like an after dark edition, then we'll have to have you back on to, 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 to talk Vegas. But, um, uh, actually, as I say, uh, we, we've got a, a big friend of the of the podcast community, uh, a chap by the name of Captain uh, Nick, used to work for Acme Red, um, which was. Uh, are you familiar with um, with uh, Are you are you familiar with uh, Captain Nick? <laughs> Captain Nick Anderson. No, I probably recognise the face though. That's probably a good thing, <laughs> to be honest. I think. <laughs> So, that's right. There's so many people. There's been about three or four people in the chat room actually asked that that question. So I thought, well, I'd be, we better ask. Just actually, so, actually so, that's, so. that's not a bad not a bad thing actually, Matt. On that subject of yeah. kind of cruise, obviously, Gemma, you you know, you're working within a huge company, yeah, such as Virgin, and you obviously got all the the the, the flight deck crews, the cabin crews, everything all within the the, the company itself. Mm. Was it, were there kind of uh, sort of people who you work with? Sort of regularly, regularly or yeah. was it more, or was it more kind of mixed people all the time and you kind of never really got to you know gel with the kind of people as such or yes yeah, so, so when i first started years ago we were obviously a lot smaller so you used to fly with each other more regularly because you weren't such a big company and we didn't fly to as many routes um but as the company has grown um you um i think in the last couple of years we were able to put in a preference as to whether you wanted to work at Heathrow or gatwick so there was a Gatwick call crew. So you did all of the, those flights that were going out of all like the leisure routes then going out of Gatwick. So you did all become very, very friendly and very familiar because you all liked flying to the same destinations. Right. So I got to know on a more personal level, a lot of the crew that liked to fly to Vegas because I was doing those flights all of the time as well. Um, and yeah, yeah you, you do used to get, you see your, your favorite destinations and, every, and you liked going to those places you rate you, you we're used to the customers that every kind of route that we did the customers were a very different dynamic so you knew what to expect and it was um it was more familiar work for me working on the vegas is i knew my customer profile whereas when you went to another destination there would be they'd have different demands or different needs um but yeah you used to get you used to know the you used to know the crew on the on the vegas i know out of gatwick especially the caribbeans everyone used to enjoy the, the same sort of thing, the similar sort of thing down route. So, um, yeah, and I think back in the early days, we did have a Caribbean core cruise. That was a little bit of a party, party fleet. <laughs> yeah, but it was a party fleet because they were doing the Hong Kong. Actually, I have, I have to ask, and, and you might not be able to say, but I'm, I'm going to have to ask because I've been thinking about it since we, we started the show. But was there anyone famous at all that you can mention that you um, met while working for the airline? Anyone, any stars on I've board? I've met a few, but I don't know. I won't name drop because <laughs> confidentiality. <Yeah. laughs> so I do respect their privacy of who they choose to fly with because um, I don't know where I'm going to work in the future. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Um, I, get, I have had lots of celebrities on and luckily, touch wood for me, they've all been really, really lovely. Oh, good. That's good. And I expect they all flew in upper class as well. Not all of them. Oh, okay. Um, all of them. You'll be surprised. 
Well, of course, it's because we we all know how expensive they are. That's the that's the trouble. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, we've got a great question here from uh, Stephen H. Uh, he's asking, um, sort of more thinking for people who perhaps want to become cabin crew. Is that what traits are airlines looking for when they recruit cabin crew? And more specifically, what would turn them off a candidate? Um, from experience, I would possibly say people who aren't inclusive of everybody. Um, I do remember from my interview process, um, they were looking for you to in include the rest of the group. If you were talking over people, if you were always the one coming up with ideas and you hadn't noticed possibly somebody who was quieter in the group um, and encouraging them to come forward, it was, it was mainly to see how you work as a team. Um, you need to sell yourself, obviously, when you're um, at an interview, but it's it's also being mindful that you are working with other people and, and it's not all about you. Uh, and you're working with people on board the aircraft that you've never met before every single day. So you have to be confident, you have to be bubbly and have a personality, but not overbearing, I think. You need to be able to blend um, with the personalities that are already within the airline so that you can for 10 hours, 11 hours on a plane, you're all able to work in relative harmony. Um, and I think they're looking for um, future management, people who are able to make decisions, able to be assertive, um, able to be firm in regards to safety procedures. Um, but it's having a balance of, of being friendly and being kind, but also being um, able to exert your authority when it comes to being um, safety related on board. Jim, I, <clears throat> I had a question about uniforms, actually. So we've done quite a few stories about airlines, at least here in the U.S., it seems like every two years they're going for new uniforms and new branding and new paint jobs. And it feels like it's just so much money spent on on uniforms and branding. Have you, what, what do you think, well, I guess two-part question. One is, who do you think has the best looking uniforms and can you maybe talk to us about the functionality of uniforms and some of the, did you ever get to? Well, know? I actually worked in uniforms when I was pregnant. So I, you, as soon as you're pregnant, you're grounded. So I worked in our uniform department then. Um, I, I tell you what I did love. I loved Air New Zealand when they had the capes. They used oh, to wear yeah. a poncho and I used to love them because they were perfect. You didn't always need a big bulky overcoat, um, but they were great for a, after a flight, especially um, when you've landed in the morning and you're tired and it's cold. They look, I always thought they looked really stylish just having their, their little cape. Um, but Singapore Airlines, they're just stunning. Whenever you see them at an airport at the security line and they're all together, they just look absolutely uh, overwhelming. They're absolutely, their uniforms are stunning. And, and all the girls and all the guys are stunning. I can't, I just never fail to be overwhelmed when you see Singapore Airlines walk through an airport. They just look magnificent. You know, to be fair, I flew quite a bit back and forth from the UK to the US in on Virgin. And I always admired you guys. You can find, I thought you all looked very professional and uh, very attractive in your uniforms and your oh, standards. It was lovely because we were able to be quite creative with our hair because we didn't wear hats. We were always encouraged to be quite creative with our hair. Um, and yeah, you used to kind of, I used to get used to the style where I could do it very quickly at sort of four <laughs> o'clock in the morning. Um, but yeah, I, I do know what you mean. When you used to see all of the sea of reds sort of sashay through the airport, it is quite a, a sight. But I, I'm kind of like that when I see Singapore Airlines as well. I, like I say, they just look incredible. But yeah, I, with, with the Virgin, with the sea of red coming through, I know that it is a, a sight to behold as well. So another, another quick one from Captain Cruise, Gemma. Uh, when you work for one airline all your career, do you also have a chance to meet other airline personnel and exchange views, or is it all Virgin crew? Yeah, it's when you're down route net, um, mainly, um, or sometimes when you're in the, the security queue at the airport. When you're at passport control, you chat to other airlines. Um, I speak to a lot of Emirates crew because we land at the same time as them in JFK. Uh, and, and yeah, it's normally down route if you are staying in the same hotel or you can talk at the bar. Um, I personally don't have very many friends who work for other airlines. All my friends are within Virgin. Um, and, and yeah, it's mainly when you are down route. But you, you, you can kind of tell who's crew. When you know that there is another airline staying in the same hotel, you can figure out who works for who. Um, in, the, the wild part is going on. So. I think as we're getting older, we don't have so many of them. <laughs> 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 kind of a quick, quick 
post-flight drink at the bar and then everyone's in bed by seven o'clock because they're so tired. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Who'd have thought that happened? So uh, rock and roll. <laughs> now, now we've, d- we've done quite well to sort of uh, avoid uh, what, what, frankly, uh, 2020 has thrown at us. Uh, but I think it's probably time to sort of uh, wander down that road if it's OK. Now, uh, uh, Tony's actually got a, a great question, which I think uh, will lead into very nicely into a project that you're you're working on and you're saying that a question for Gemma um, how are your fellow cabin crew colleagues managing in these difficult times obviously with so many redundancies and things going on as well I mean it, it, there's no two ways of sugarcoating this is it, it 2020 has been a horrendous year for the aviation industry well it's absolutely decimated it um, especially for Virgin we had nearly just under 5,000 crew and I think um, they're now going to be left with about 1200 Wow. So, um, yeah, so many of my colleagues have been uh, made redundant. It's kind of been in two rounds. Um, there is a holding pool for some of the crew to come back when hopefully things will pick up, which is great for them. So I really do hope aviation does get back on its feet. Um, but um, in the meantime, I've been helping um, a lot of the crew who have started small businesses, um, promote them, that their, their businesses on social media um, and giving them advice how they start their own business or how they're able to um, reach out to a big audience to be able to um, start a different life. It's, it's, it's daunting for everyone. No one expected it. Um, I never thought I'd work anywhere else. I thought I'd still be pushing the cart at 65. <laughs> uh, I just never dreamed of doing anything else. But it's kind of forced you into realising there is life after flying. Um, we also have a support group on Facebook called Not Just Crew, which has been absolutely gold um, for those that have been made redundant in finding life after flying. There's a lot of inspirational stories on there, um, help about CVs. Like even for so many of us, I didn't even have a CV. Um, so yeah, that, there's our crew business page. We are, um, we are on Instagram and we are on Facebook. Um, and it's just trying to help the crew start a new chapter in their lives. It's finding a way for them to be able to get their businesses out there, get them promoted, um, just get people to realise that they are out, out there and that they are trying to make a life for themselves after flying because j- jobs are very difficult to get hold of. There's such a massive um, pool of people now trying to find work um, from all different industries. Um, cabin crew have got such an, an amazing skill set. I, I truly believe we have skills that you wouldn't find in any, any other industry. Um, but for those that have started their own businesses and tried to set up from from home um, and start again it's they just need that help they need that support and that encouragement so that's what I've been working on um, through the summer really so um, hopefully their businesses will flourish especially in this lead up to Christmas there are some beautiful and unique items on there um, amazing services um, and, and the idea was to to shop shop small and shop local and the local is our our little local flying family really mm, how, how did this all come about Gemma when, when you yeah, know who came up with the idea initially and said we're going to do this and so I started it about 18 months ago it was purely for our Virgin Atlantic colleagues because I have a business with my husband um car valeting. so I thought oh well what, I wonder what other crew are doing I wonder what they're doing um, when they're not flying so I started this page and we kind of only had about four or five hundred members it was just Virgin Atlantic crew and they were just showcasing their little businesses and since the lockdown we opened it up to other airlines to join us realizing that there were so many more um, in the same in the same boat British Airways making redundancies now EasyJet um, and obviously Thomas Cook they were made redundant um, last October or at the end of September. So there were so many other crew who were in the same situation as, as we were finding ourselves in. So we opened it up and now I think we're just short, shy of, of 2,000 members. Um, I started the Instagram because I thought a lot of the, the pictures were um, so beautiful and it was easier to have them all on, on one location so you could look through. Um, and yeah, we are working on a very exciting project that I can't divulge just yet, but stay tuned. Um, and yeah, hopefully we'll be announcing it this week. Um, something really great for all of our businesses in the run up to Christmas so that hopefully people will buy from them, buy gifts um, and, and give them that boost. It's more the, the positive and inspirational boost that they need or that somebody believes in them and what they're doing um, and their reason to get out of bed in the morning. You kind of lose that purpose when you are made redundant because flying is all you've known. 
So it was something that they could focus on and something positive after something um, so upsetting that's happened to them after being cabin crew and flying. Uh, and it's not just cabin crew, it's pilots. We have other people in aviation. Um, so yeah, we are open to everyone who's, who's worked in any form of aviation to join us. It's open to everyone. So now, I mean, we, we found, about, uh, found out about your work through actually Andrew from the plane reclaimers, didn't we? Which is uh, yeah. how come we, we, we sort of got in touch, really. And um, I, I have to say, really, I mean, it just sounds like such a, a wonderful project. And I mean, my hat's off to you and the guys involved, really, to come up with such a uh, sort of an inspirational way of trying to sort of, in some respects, trying to make, you know, keep the family together almost yeah. by sort of staying in, in touch with each other. And I'm, I'm sure I, I speak on behalf of... Uh, all of us here if there's anything we can do to help you sort of uh, promote what you're doing um, you know we've uh, I, I used to make adverts for a local radio station and things like that so if there's anything that we can do to to help your amazing little family then I'm, I'm sure we'd be more than happy to, to to give you a hand really because it just sounds like such an exciting project and it's 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 been a long time since I've sort of looked at something that's really sort of sparked my interest you know what I mean sort of thinking this this is such a great idea so yeah as I say if there's anything we can do then then do reach out to us again Thank you. Yeah, it's a day. It's a great idea. Honestly, like Matt said, it's a really, really, really great idea. And I think it's important, especially with what's going on, that um, everyone in the industry, um, like you said, as, as pilots or cabin crew, have that kind of somewhere to go to yeah. get advice mm -hmm. and to, to, you know, to, to move forward. And obviously, you know, you know, they can move forward and there's some great, and I've looked on the Instagram page today and stuff, and there's some great ideas, honestly. Some, like you said, some great, uh, some great artwork and stuff on there as well. Indeed, yeah. Well, Gemma, thank you so very much for, for giving us your, your time this evening to to talk about it we're going to have to sort of move on unfortunately because uh, we're, we're running out of time but uh, it, it's just as I say uh, don't don't be a stranger do stay in touch and uh, we look forward to having you on well we want to hear all about this new project you're talking about as well so uh, you need you need to reach out to us and talk to us about that I will do thank you yes yeah, it's, it's very exciting I'm meeting um, I've got a meeting tomorrow night so hopefully I'll have some more information Ooh. and we'll be able to share a little bit more it's exciting fantastic way <laughs> So thanks again, Gemma, for coming on. Like Matt said, stay with us. And uh, we've got some news coming up. But uh, just quick last one before we go, Gemma. Um, where does the future stand? You know, what, what, what are you going to look forward to in the future now? Kind of the, the whole project uh, going forward? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to helping all of these other businesses. I'm working really hard on our car relating company at home um, and promoting that a little bit more because I was always away. I was never at home to even really focus on our business. Um, and I have two children as well. So it, it does take a lot of effort. But um, now I'm at home, I'm actually enjoying just being at home with my kids for a little bit longer and not being so tired. Um, but I, yeah, I, I am a worker and I do like to keep busy. So um, this, this crew business is op opportunity is keeping me very occupied at the minute. Excellent. Thanks again, Gemma, for coming on. It's been great to hear from you. And uh, we are going to move on to the next part of the show. And uh, for those of you uh, who may have been listening to, we held the competition a while back, uh, back in episode uh, 330. Or was it? No, 324, sorry. Episode 324 with the Plain Reclaimers for that prize, uh, which uh, we had Andrew van der Sag win. But we also asked everyone to send us in their stories of aviation in their lives. And uh, this week, we have got uh, a little story that was sent in to us uh, by Martin. Hi, Carlos, Matt, Nev, Armando. My love of aviation, as many of us, goes all the way back to childhood. I'm in my early 50s now, but have many fond memories of air travel when I was in single digits. Back then I never realised just how lucky I was when my buddies in junior school were off down to Margate Broadstairs for their holiday, and I was off to some Spanish destination on board a Dan Air from Gatwick, probably a 727 or such like. I remember on one occasion sitting next to my sister and my mother and father sitting in the adjacent seats when the captain came out of the cockpit mid-flight wearing dark glasses and tapping a white stick from side to side on the seat frames. Well, you can imagine me and my sister's face. The adults were giggling and the kids were shocked, their mouths opened, and it turned out this was a regular little stunt he pulled when he had a few kids on board and he walked back through the cabin talking to all the kids in turn 
You can imagine Captain L getting away with something like that today. This was over 40 years ago, and I've never forgotten it. On another occasion, with my own kids, two daughters, we were on a flight from Gatwick down to the Canary Islands on a Britannia Airways 767. If I remember correctly, when they were invited all up to the business end for a look at what goes on up there. They were so excited, and on their return, as the captain had let them change direction of the flight, with a turn of the switch, one girl turned the jet to the left and the other to the right, and the captain put it back in the middle to take it on its route. What a shame that kids of today will probably never have the opportunity to experience such things. In my early twenties, I decided to start flying lessons at Biggin Hill, which is our local airfield, and I had a cheap taste of flight, and then went on to spend a nice few quid there. I did enjoy it, but after a £260 lesson, this is like 30 years ago, and 22 hours, I gave it up. I considered and consulted with our first daughter's arrival, and I could not justify the expense. As the years have rolled by, I have travelled extensively, and still look forward to it as much as today as I did back then. Thanks to all the guys and girls that have made this possible, and let's hope they all get back to work very soon with their T and C not too badly eaten in two. I know it's late, but I thought I'd send this anyway, and thanks for all the hard work. All the best guys, Martin. So, kicking off this week's first news story then, and this one is on the UK Aviation dot news website uh, forward slash Exeter if you want to be oh, right. very, very specific yeah. <laughs> and uh, this is uh, this is actually really good news actually in what's going on in the, in the world now but mm. Exeter Aerospace launches in former Flybe facility so uh, at Dublin this is uh, island based aviation maintenance company Dublin Aerospace Group has launched Exeter Aerospace in the former Flybe maintenance facility at Exeter Airport the group already provides maintenance for Boeing 737 and A320 Airbus and A330 families at the site in Ireland, but now aims to complement that with a regional jet maintenance at Exeter. Exeter Aerospace plans to operate six maintenance bays, specialising in Embraer 170-190 regional jets, along with Bombardier-8 Q400s and ATR-72. You're saying it wrong. <laughs> oh, go on, get it off your chest. Bombardier! There we go. Thank there you. I've got another lie down now. <laughs> uh, Exeter, Exeter Aerospace is already seeking to hire 100 aircraft mechanics, engineers and aviation professionals offering a potential lifeline to engineers that lost their jobs when Flybe collapsed. McCarthy added uh, in the story that he said already we have acquired all of the tooling the equipment we require for these aircraft types and have taken possession of the modern and purpose-built Exeter hangars and workshops. We are now in the process of applying for UK CAA and EASA EU Aviation Safety Authority approvals for Exeter Aerospace and have already commenced hiring our initial group of aerospace space engineers and technicians. The plan over the next three to four years is to increase its initial 100 employees to 250, providing a much needed boost for the local economy. If you are an aircraft maintenance engineer or have experience in an aircraft maintenance direct support staff position, then you can email your CV to recruit at exeteraerospace.com the notes will be uh, or the page links will be in the show notes yep. for this show um, but this is great news especially what's what's going on now and obviously the the best thing about this as well guys is the fact that for as the story said for all those that lost their um, their jobs when flyby collapsed uh, in the maintenance side of things they can at least try and apply for you know to get back in where they you know previously worked well in this in in this industry, you know, stuff with uh, knowing that uh, you know so many bad things are going on at the moment. As you say, is like anything to do with positive jobs uh, has got to be a good sign as far as the um, as far as the industry is concerned, isn't it? So, uh, fingers crossed that that that's a great success, really. 
yeah, it's good news. And let's hope we hear some more of these kinds of stories mm. um, on the show. Yeah. If So if you're one of those uh, people and would like to uh, uh, get in, in touch with them, uh, the email address, I think, was, was it recruitment at? Recruitment. Recruit. Recruit. Sorry. Yeah, recruit at exeteraerospace.com. There we go. Recruit at yeah, exeter I'll aerospace. add one more thing on this. Is, yeah, do. Uh, don't uh, don't limit yourself because often big maintenance operations like these require more personnel than just mechanics and engineers they need program managers they need um, office staff administrative staff so if you are in the aviation industry absolutely uh, in a position like mine maybe i was a, a you know i was a pilot but uh, but i also had a, a second career that you may be able to provide uh, an experience to a company like this so so if you think you're looking for something in the aviation industry and you're not a mechanic or an engineer, I would probably still send your resume or your CV because you never know what positions they have. Actually, Nick Codling in the chat room, Matt, says he can't believe he's only just heard about this. He only lives 15 minutes from Exeter Airport. <laughs> it's usually the way, isn't it? Mm. It's pretty typical, isn't it? <laughs> so that's we why are. we're here. All right, well, let's That's just bring here. the show to a close right now. Yeah, We've done our good deed. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck, Nick. <laughs> Job done. Yes, excellent. So, so anyway, yeah, moving next. on to the next story. Yeah. Um, Matt, uh, you've got uh, a little little bit of a Ryanair story here. Uh, yes, indeed. Well, I mean, story two has to be a Ryanair story where mm. at all humanly possible. And the headline on simpleflying.com is Ryanair locks horns with rival Aer Lingus on Twitter. Uh, so this week's Aer Lingus and Ryanair engaged uh, in some friendly banter on Twitter. The two Irish carriers took digs at each other to delight men Many of their followers. Uh, it was Aer Lingus that took the first jab. I'm going to try and bring these up while I'm talking, so sorry if I, I screw this up. Uh, but uh, there we go. So uh, it's basically saying this is, <laughs> it was uh, Aer Lingus that took the first jab. On the 29th of September, the flag carrier of Ireland tweeted a comedy sketch shared by RTE presenter Carl Moolan. Uh, the video <laughs> uh, compared the landing process of the two airlines. Uh, Moolan uh, first acted as uh, Mullen, sorry, I'm saying it wrong i'm being told mullen first acted as a passenger of Aer Lingus, sleeping through the smooth and gentle landing procedure however uh, in the next clip he portrayed a ryanair passenger being shaken by a bouncy landing uh, should we take a little look at the video now let, let, let's oh have please a... do man. yeah okay you rather like this video don't you <laughs> oh, <I love> it. <laughs> here we go right <laughs> so there he is he's he's just landing on his Are we here? Just didn't even know we lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know. Uh, <laughs> it's probably a little little extreme there. Anyway, when recruit when retweeting the video, the Aer Lingus uh, admin signed off by stating true story. Many of the airline's followers laughed as at the joke, but uh, several individuals expressed their support for Ryanair. Uh, nonetheless, Ryanair uh, wasn't going to be taking things lying down. The low-cost carrier replied by asking its com um, compatriot what it knew about landings, sharing a picture comparing the number of flights that the two airlines have in the skies. Uh, the image ultimately shows that there are significantly fewer Aer Lingus uh, flights. Um, <laughs> yeah, significantly uh, less Aer Lingus flights in the air. The, the single tweet nonetheless summarises the impact that the social, the current social and political climate is having on the aviation industry. Um, I mean, I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's all good, clean fun. I'm sure it's all good, clean fun. Honestly, that <laughs> it, it was on, the the one back from Ryanair was good as well. I mean, that is that is one of those <laughs> kind of moments, isn't it? You know, yeah. Uh, look at us. We, you've got what three flights in the air, and yeah, we've yeah. got I mean, three hundred. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What yeah. would you know about landings? Mm. Yes, indeed. What, what do you think, Armando? <laughs> bit, a bit of uh, tit for tat. <laughs> oh, it's up. all health. It's all healthy. Healthy banter. Healthy you know. banter. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> Lane Street's just said in the chat room, sorry, it's quantity <laughs> versus qual no, quality versus quantity. Oh. But, uh, oh, no, I was right, sorry, quantity versus quality. Anyway, it works either way around. Uh, <laughs> oh. There we go, never mind. Okay, on to the next story then, please. And uh, Armando, I think this is with you. Yeah, this one's from the BBC.com. And uh, if you're stepping on a Japan Airlines uh, plane any time in the next month, chances are that you won't hear the term ladies and gentlemen anymore. 
So instead, from one October, gender-neutral phrases like "attention all passengers" or references to passengers as "everyone" in quotes will be used. Uh, reported a local site to the Main Mainichi. Uh, Japan, Air Japan Airlines is one of a few global airlines to embrace gender neutral greetings. However, it will only apply to JAL's English announcements. That is because in Japanese, the expression generally used for such announcements is already gender neutral, according to that agency. Uh, JAL, JAL's decision has not made any major waves in Japan. Uh, according to the BBC, or according to a sociologist uh, at Hiroshima Shudo University, uh, he said it's a small deal that most people don't really care about because this change in announcement in English cannot be understood nor noticed by almost all of the Japanese-speaking passengers. However, as one of the leading LGBT-friendly enterprises in Japan, their efforts should be appreciated and therefore will be and must be a significant step forward to the improvement of other LGBT plus issues. Uh, I think that it's important for big companies to start good practices like this because other medium or small size companies tend to follow. Uh, Japan Airlines follows airlines like Air Canada and EasyJet, which adopted gender neutral greetings last year. In a statement uh, to Reuters, JAL said it wanted to create a positive atmosphere and treat everyone with respect. We have not committed to discriminate, or we have committed to not discriminate based on gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, or other personal attributes. Uh, Same-sex marriage is not legally recognized in Japan, though surveys suggest that there is su uh, strong support for this. Uh, last year, 13 same-sex couples across Japan took legal action against the government, uh, demanding the right to get married. Um, I don't know, that last part didn't really have anything to do with aviation, but uh, yeah, I think it's just a sign of uh, changing times and, you know, uh, big companies do have to adapt and, and it's just one of these things where I'm sure 20 years from now, we will look back on today and say, man, what were we doing? Um, but uh, yeah, it's entirely their uh, prerogative to do this and I support it. Absolutely. Not what do really, you guys think? Yeah, yeah. It's it, it's sort of it's sort of, if, uh, yes. Uh, John is just saying in my ear. Sorry that it follows uh, uh, very much like with the uh, with the Japanese language. It's sort of as you say in that story because they, they were saying essentially it's you know that their greeting they haven't had to do anything with because it, it's uh, already gender gender neutral. I suppose it's just I don't know. So, um, some of it is traditional traditions, I guess, as well. I mean, I must admit I've never really found you know the statement of ladies and gentlemen particularly um you know of offensive any in any way shape or form but then you know times are changing so perhaps it is time to to be a little bit more open-minded and and you know sort of adjust you know greetings accordingly you know and i and i've we have uh family members that are in that are cabin crew and you know they, they've told us well we actually we like we we miss saying the greeting ladies and gentlemen mm. um i would have loved to have actually gotten Gemma's take on this one as someone who has done this yeah. you know for so long <laughs> indeed um, absolutely you know and uh, some interesting comment i think i do think we need to reference a couple of comments in the chat room here uh armando one of richard is saying what's easy jet's greeting going to be is it going to be oi you uh which i think is uh <laughs> probably uh uh, I, I don't know. Uh, to I, I, Tony, Tony, Tony's Tony S. Long, yeah. long, you so people like, sit down and, and be, be quiet. quiet. Yes, I don't think that's ever going to happen either. But uh, yes. It's... Mm. <laughs> oh, right. Oh, that's Ryanair, apparently. I'm being told. Well, doesn't, doesn't Ryanair charge you for a safety brief? <laughs> Good point. Good point. Well made. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and yeah. oxygen. Life, um, life jackets are extra, that sort of mm. thing. Yeah, absolutely. Seats. Yeah, you, have to put, you have to put a £2 coin in the. Um, uh, two pound coin in the in the slot to get the uh, the the uh, the f uh, jackets out. Uh, it's I was I was just, sorry. <laughs> Captain <laughs> oh Cruise. The Captain Cruise is saying, "Short to their planes were always universal, future orientated industry." Good point. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, moving on <laughs> to the next story. Shell. Yes, and, uh, Yeah, this, uh, this, this, this next story, this one is on simpleflying.com's website. And uh, headline, COVID, uh, COVID won't lead to Lufthansa retiring the 747 early. Good news. Lufthansa has been decisive in the right sizing uh, of 
its full downsizing with its fleet. However, last week, CEO Carsten Svur confirmed the 747-400s would be with us for a little longer. Once Lufthansa made the decision to further cut their fleet size, the word on the ground was that the, both the A380s and the 747-400 fleet would be entirely removed. However, as we covered in episode 336, story uh, number one on the show, it was the A380s that were confirmed to be unlikely to return. The airline said the remaining eight A380s would be grounded long term and would only like make a comeback if demand suddenly shot up. Uh, these will be joined by an additional 10 A340s, which have been previously marked for a service to return or to return to service soon. And uh, not to mention, or no mention, I should say, was made of the 747-400s. Uh, speaking last week, World uh, the World Aviation Festival CEO of Lufthansa, Carsten Sfer, uh, outlined the plans for the 747s in his fleet. And he said... What is important is that when you talk about the 747s at Lufthansa, we have two types. We have the uh, 14 or fairly old uh, 747-400s, which will be retiring over the course of the middle of this decade. And this was always planned, he said, to be this way, and they were already in our fleet reduction plan. And of course, we have our brand new shiny 747-8s, which we love to operate, he said. They're the most efficient aircraft on the fleet, for those routes where we have 400 people on board so we took the decision to take the 380s out and to keep the 747-8s in and that will be our flagship while Lufthansa may not have much use for the 747-400s right now it seems to, to be their uh, exceptional cargo capacity that has stayed in its hand taking them out of the fleet permanently uh, with capacity down and demand for cargo on the rise the price of air freight has uh, air freight has soared and it's likely that it's uh, saved Lufthansa's dash 400s as the CEO keeps an eye on potentially returning them primarily as load shifters rather than people movers and it's safe to say that with the facts and figures that are on these uh, glorious show notes uh, done for us by John, it does uh, make for, I didn't realise quite there was quite such a difference uh, in the cargo capacities between the 380 and the 747-8i. But uh, just to give you a quick quick run on the 380s, um, metric tonnes, 11.86 uh, 11 metric tonnes uh, cargo capacity on the A380. Compare that, uh, this is on the Lufthansa's versions, uh, and compare that with the 747-8 um, with 16.91 tonnes cargo capacity. So even though the uh, 380 is the largest aircraft, it doesn't have the largest cargo capacity on the, on the Lufthansa versions. So yeah, it's, um, it's uh, obviously it's good news. Um, because it's obviously it's probably good news for Boeing actually because they'll be able to sell some uh, spare parts <laughs> for these aircraft. But right, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's uh, obviously you know we, we are going to get to the stage soon, guys, where we are literally going to have to go quite some distance to travel on an A three eighty anywhere mm. on holiday. Indeed. Anyway, on to the next story. This is on samchewy.com. We're a big fan of Sam Chewy. We had him on the show a couple of years ago now, wasn't it? I think mm. was it five years ago, something like that. A long time ago, anyway. Uh, and uh, his website is great, as as you all know. Uh, this story comes from uh, said website, and the headline is Rex Secures Ex-Virgin Australia 737s for Intercity Flights. So Australia's Regional Express, that's Rex, has uh, secured six Ex-Virgin Boeing 737s 800NG aircraft for their upcoming capital city flights according to information obtained by samchewy.com last two letters of uh, intent were signed with Virgin's former uh, lessers who cannot be named yet the airline which has solely focused on regional services will launch the Sydney Melbourne flights on the 1st of March 2021 on board each aircraft will be eight uh, 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 Virgin Australia business class seats but a decision on their use is still pending. Uh, the first aircraft will be delivered on the 1st of November. The remaining four will be gradually phased in over the following four months. Three of these aircraft will be uh, deployed in the first phase of Rex's launch in the 1st of March 2021 on the Sydney-Melbourne route with another two aircraft beginning service before Easter. From there Rex will continue to grow the domestic fleet in line with the return pa uh, passenger demand. Uh, 
uh, they are hoping to see their fleet of 737-800 NGs reach 10 by the end of 2021. A spokesman confirmed that once the Sydney Melbourne services are established and providing successful, um, the or proving sorry successful, the airline will also launch Sydney Brisbane services. Uh, Canberra, Perth, and Adelaide are also on the table, but cannot be confirmed at this time. Rex hopes to obtain regulatory approval by December. Advanced ticket sales are also envisaged for December, uh, subject to regulatory approval. Rex signed a long-term leash, uh, long-term sheet with the investment firm PAG Asia, Asia Capital to entirely fund their domestic jet operations. The Kickstart package has been valued at around about 151. Uh, million Australian dollars that's around about 107.5 million uh, dollars US dollars um, so it's uh, it's an interesting story I suppose uh, it was inevitable that they would start sort of you know selling off obviously you know Virgin Australia's some of Virgin Australia's assets um, but I mean this is this is sort of good news really I suppose isn't it and and 737s we know are, are, are an ideal aircraft for for sort of you know short short hops like this um, although I don't suppose it's the shortest flight in the world is it uh, from Sydney to, to Melbourne because it's a big old country isn't it <laughs> yeah Australia is pretty big and I think uh, uh, 737 counts as a regional airplane over there uh, considering the distances they have but well, yes yeah <laughs> yeah, I think Virgin Australia is, is in an interesting situation because they were just, you know, they're welcoming all these 737-800 NGs and, um, you know, they're already sort of passing them off to other airplanes or other airlines. I know I was just flying in Nashville just recently and um, I saw a couple of Embraer uh, E-190s from Virgin Australia that have been... Um, ferried over to the u.s and i wonder if they're also going to a different airline but yeah like you said matt the 737 is one of those kind of workhorse type of airplanes that uh, no matter how they, how they shift hands they're always going to have a long flying life aren't they just just quickly i hadn't heard rex i had to do a quick little google there and uh 2002 they started operations so ah. didn't i hadn't heard of rex it's one of the ones i hadn't heard of so Mm. Actually, yeah, we better say as well a big thanks to Jacob Darlington Brown for uh, sending us uh, sending us the links to that story yeah, as well. So absolutely. thanks to you, Jacob, for that. Very much appreciated. So moving on with the next story then, and uh, this one is who is this one? This is Armando, and you've got a rather good story for anyone interested in space. Yeah, I feel like we're gonna we're gonna have to name this episode the the Boeing episode because all of our stories <laughs> are Boeing. And then they're good stories. Yeah. So, so the one about Boeing with Gemma. Um, so let's see from simpleflying.com, NASA, for all of those that didn't know, actually owns a 747. It is a 747 SP. Uh, it is called the Strat uh, Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy, uh, otherwise known as SOFIA. Uh, that airplane has crossed the Atlantic on, the, on her way to Lufthansa Technik in Hamburg. The one-of-a-kind aircraft will be touching down shortly after 1900 local time this evening to undergo a sea check with the German maintenance specialist. Uh, the modified German, or German, the modified jetliner, which carries a 106-inch diameter telescope, is currently on the way from California to Hamburg, uh, according to a spokesperson from Lufthansa Technik. Uh, that aircraft is supposed to run through a sea check with the maintenance provider. In addition, some of the scientific equipment will undergo te technical servicing. A sea check is usually uh, takes an aircraft out of out of service for one to two weeks, and it's part of a just a phased uh, maintenance program. Um, this is not the first time that Sophia has uh, made a call at Lufthansa's Technik headquarters. She did make the, German, uh, the journey to the hangars in Hamburg for a complete overhaul in 2014. She also came back in 2017 for a scheduled heavy maintenance check. The intention is to keep the nearly 43-year-old special performance plane, a uh, joint project between German Aerospace Center and the U.S. Uh, NASA or National Aeronautics and Space Administration, functioning optimally so it can fulfill its mission reliably until 2034. So as we talk about airplanes or 747s having a uh, long career, this one is designed to keep looking at space until 2034. 
That is, that's pretty amazing, Amanda. Like you said, this aircraft is 43 and a half years old. Um, quick bit of history. So that was first owned by Pan Am back in 1977. Then it moved on to United Airlines in 1986 and then was brought by NASA in October 1997. So it's, it's, had had a, a while. it's had a few owners, yeah, but it's uh, made These SPs are awesome. I think there's a comment in the chat room, Matt, um, from, here we go, from Stephen H. Uh, he said he likes the, the, he likes the 747 SP, not so much a flying wing, but a flying tail. <laughs> Which I think, <laughs> if, you, if you look at the pictures, honestly, it is, the, the tail is, is nearly as large as the aircraft itself. It does look like a cartoon gone wrong, doesn't it? And I know mm. that a couple months ago, APG was talking to Rick, to Miami Rick, about flying the, the 747, um, the super, oh, the Dreamlifter, the Dreamlifter, yeah, mm. and the aerodynamics not actually being that terribly different, except for some minor considerations. But this airplane has a gaping hole on its side. <laughs> you know, it's got a, a rolling door with a with a, a telescope in it, and it, it I can't. I would be very interested to see how how this airplane flies with just a, a big sort of 20 foot by 20 foot hole along the side. Maybe that's, yeah, maybe we can reach out to, to NASA and- uh, But, um, <laughs> but imagine standing that. near that gaping hole, Armando, and having the view out of that, um, you know, being able to look out there. I mean, you'd have to hold yeah. on pretty tight. You would have to hold on fairly tight and it <laughs> might be a bit cold. Yeah. Um, well, I think that any military transport pilot has probably had this, a similar view because we do high altitude, low opening drops or, or high altitude parachute drops where you may be at 18, 20, 22,000 feet and open the cargo door in the back and you're just looking out. And it, it is a little bit eerie when the, the air is just not that thick. You know, you can feel the thinness in the air. You can feel the, the coolness on your, on your face, on your helmet because you're on oxygen. It is a, a very interesting feeling to be just staring out at space. Uh, to when, Tony when S is offering a, a, a what he describes as a not so fun fact. Apparently, the Boeing uh, Dreamlifter uses the same fin from the SP. Well, there you go. Ooh, there you okay. go. They, can be car they can be cartoon cartoon buddies together. Right, indeed. Uh, John Jester uh, was actually saying as well uh, that uh, you need to have the bigger tail to compensate for the lack of leverage. Uh, and uh, then goes on to say that uh, a shorter arm back uh, to the tail. So uh, there we are. I suppose that's uh, it's uh, I mean, it <laughs> Lane Lane Street. <laughs> <laughs> I think Lane Lane's in reference to the um, uh, Space Odyssey uh, film, isn't he? Okay. Oh uh, right. Op yes. Open yeah. the pod door. Open the pod bay door, Hal. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Right. We better move on to the next. So story. So next story. Yeah, this one is comes to us from uh, AviationWeek.com with bits from as well from the 3D Printing Media Network and also blog.gaviation.com. And uh, moving from one large aircraft to a large engine. So GE Aviation uh, Engine for Boeing 777X earns FAA certification. So GE Aviation's GE9X, the largest aircraft engine yet developed, has received FAA certification, marking a major step towards entry into service on the Boeing 777-9, the first of the 777X family in 2022. Although certification tests were held up for several months in 2019, GE cleared a redesign in time for the start of the 777-9 flight tests in January. Eight GE9X engines plus two spares have so far been delivered to Boeing as power plants for the four 777-9 test aircraft. The test engines accumulated just under 5,000 hours and 8,000 cycles during the certification program, which included flights on the company's 747-400 flying testbed. Overall, 72 GE9X test flights, totaling more than 400 hours, were flown on the 747, which first flew with the engine on the left inboard wing position in March 2018. With the FAA engine certification completed, GE can now begin produ uh, producing uh, of uh, the first batch of the production GE9X units, deliveries of which to Boeing are expected to begin later this year. The company also continues to run ground tests of engines for extended operations approval or ETOPS. 
Aside from the 134-inch diameter fan, which comprises of 16 composite blades, the GE9X has an overall pressure ratio of 60 to 1, which is the highest for any commercial engine, as well as incorporating of, or incorporation of more than 300 uh, added, uh, um, manufactured 3D printed parts as well. Uh, the fuel efficient engine also integrates 3D printed titanium alumide, alumide blenjen blades uh, crafted by GE teams at Avio Aero in Italy and GE's Additive Technology Center in Ohio. Uh, the GE9X engine is designed to achieve 10% lower fuel consumption compared to the GE9011 or 115B and 5% better than any other engine in its class. The engine will also operate with less smog causing emissions than any other engine in its class as well. That's good, going green. Uh, the Boeing 777X, for its part, is expected to enter service in the first half of 2022. And I am very much looking forward to this as well. Because this engine is blooming massive. It is really huge. Mm. Uh, in um, fact, Paul, Paul said that in the chat room. He was saying it was an absolutely absolute monster of, uh, of, of an engine. But uh, it's... Uh... Actually, the pictures of this, uh, which we've seen of this uh, on the flying test bed, the 747, you know, it, it, they've, they've obviously got one of these engines on there for test purposes. But can you imagine re-engining a 747 with four of these engines? <laughs> it would look, it would look quite bizarre, I think, because they are they are really really big engines. Indeed. Indeed. So moving on yep. to the next story, and uh, Matt, this one comes. Uh, well, this is all about uh, those. Uh, Weird fuel cells. <laughs> Weird fuel cells, right, okay. Uh, so the uh, the story that uh, we start with uh, on this particular subject comes from uh, flyingmag.com and uh, the headline is Zero uh, Avia completes uh, milestone hydrogen fuel cell flight, which is uh, very exciting really. So when a highly, motiva uh, highly modified uh, Piper Malibu Mirage broke uh, ground uh, in Cranfield, England last week for a lap around the pattern and return for landing from the ground it appeared to be a typical flight what was notable notable about the uh, short circuit around the airport was that the airplane was powered by a hydrogen fuel cell uh, which zero avia says is the world's first flight with zero emission fuel for a commercial grade passenger airplane uh, so uh, zero avia is a leading innovator in the decarbonization of aviation of aviation and the achievement is the first step in realizing the transformational uh, possibilities for, of moving from fossil fuels to zero emission hydrogen as the primary energy source for commercial aviation. Eventually and without any fundamental science required, the company says hydrogen powered aircraft will match the flight distances and payloads of the current fossil fuel powered aircraft. The next step for hydrogen powered aviation will be 10 to 20 seat aircraft which is the minimal size boundary for a commercial aircraft. We at Zero Avia are already striving diligently towards this goal with our sights on a 250 mile flight by the end of this year said um, the CEO and founder of Zero Avia and I want to say Val M M Miftakov so Mr. Miftakov, sorry about that. Uh, we're also uh, working with regulators to write the book on what hydrogen aircraft standards should be. Once that book is written, we will begin to see the progression and scaling up to larger aircraft quite quickly. In the next five years, we will power 50 seat aircraft for 500 plus miles. By the end of this decade, we will achieve flights of a 100 seat jet size aircraft that can travel over over 1,000 miles. I mean, that's really, really exciting. So we move uh, sort of on to a, a, another sort of concept, I suppose. So aerospace giant uh, Airbus has also unveiled plans for what it hailed as the first uh, commercial zero emission aircraft and uh, basically the company said that the hydrogen fuel passenger planes uh, could be in service by 2035. All three planes uh, would be powered by gas turbine engines modified to burn uh, liquid hydrogen and through hydrogen fuel cells to create electrical power. However Airbus admitted that for the first uh, uh, for the idea to work airports would have to invest large sums of money in refueling infrastructure 
structure. Uh, <clears throat> the new Airbus designs are a fruit of a joint research uh, program that Airbus launched with EasyJet last year to consider hybrid and electric aircraft. I mean, we're seeing more and more stories. Uh, that was uh, that segment uh, was taken from the BBC uh, website, by the way. But we're seeing more and more stories now, aren't we, where they're looking at alternative ways, uh, sort of trying to move away from your standard fossil fuels and things. And I mean, uh, and, and last week, I think we were running stories about electric aircraft and things as well. I mean, it's uh, th there does seem to be sort of uh, romping up. I quite like, personally, as a, I, I quite like the idea of the, the, the hydrogen sort of fuel cell thing, because you're not relying very heavily on sort of batteries, which do worry me, I have to confess if you're you know not on the ground uh that's a, that's something that worries me uh but uh, yeah we'll have to sort of uh, we'll have to see how that goes i'm just i've got some pictures here to try and pop up actually so um it, as i say it has actually taken off already this is this aircraft it's a it's a cr so this is the zero avia as i say it looks very much like um like your standard piper doesn't it really it doesn't look like it's had too much uh, of an alteration at all really um and then obviously on to the airbus uh, concept um, idea there um, to sort of uh, you know sort of uh, attempt a bit of a hybrid I suppose really with using power cells and uh, and, uh, and electricity uh, as well but I mean I, I must say that that, that that looks very space age doesn't it the uh, the, the the last picture there uh, which is what they're calling the Airbus zero e it looks a, a just looks it looks like someone's got an, a, an a350 chopped off <laughs> the back end and then squished it and stuck some wings You know what on. it reminds me of, don't you? And you're a big fan of all things Star Trek. It looks like one of the one of the, one of the shuttlecrafts oh, that are usually mm. in the holding bay. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, it, yeah, yeah, I'm being told to describe it a little bit better in the audio. I'm not really quite sure how I would go well, about doing it's, that. It's kind, it's kind of it's an A3. It's, it's kind of an A350 um, cockpit with a. Um, a triangle fuselage, which is very short, and it has two wings each side. It doesn't have a tail fin. Mm. It just has uh, the engine nacelles on top. If you're listening nacelles, to the audio version, actually, very Star Trek. Yeah, just quickly Google Airbus Zero E, and you'll you'll find pictures of it. It's a fascinating looking aircraft. It really is. I think Armando will be I, test flying this next week. Oh, next week. I think I think Richard <laughs> Adams in a in the chat room pretty much sums it up. It's somewhere between a sunfish and a pancake with wings. So. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Yes. Yes, that works. Yes. <laughs> That's also an excellent. Uh, yes. Uh, I, I, I was going to say whiz. I was going to say whiz. Write that down. <laughs> you know, I, I remember seeing that. I saw this article at the at the beginning of this week because if you guys remember in Oshkosh last year, we interviewed the Airbus uh, Americas director of research and development, and um, her communications director Bart uh, and I are connected on one of the social media. Um, platforms and he posted this just at the beginning of this week and and kind of continuing on if you're if you're listening to the audio version of this podcast go over and check out Airbus's website because two of the aircraft look fairly conventional one of them looks like an ATR and the other one looks like a mini A350 or, or a version of an A350 but yeah the pancake with wings is just a you know a little bit of a revolutionary design that I hadn't seen um, before but Indeed. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah, Matt, I couldn't agree with you more. You're, this is a, I think we're in the, in the middle of a revolution in aviation yeah. and, and probably we'll see in the next 10 to 15 years the more, you know, an equal amount of advancements as we did from sort of 1903 to 1940. Um, and then it kind of stayed until the jet age, and then I think we're entering a new a new age in aviation. Do you, Do you think some of this is because obviously um, there's been such a downturn, if you like? I, I, the, do you think it's because people are now more actively looking at um, sort of solving these issues because? Uh, the demand for aviation and, and flying isn't there like it was or do you think it's just that essentially there's so little aviation news out there that you know we're hearing more about these stories because there's not a lot else sort of you know that the, these are important stories because nothing else is being sort of taken up by the, the, the slots if that no, makes sense. I, I, don't, I don't think it's any of those things personally I, I think it's just a natural evolution because we're seeing the same thing in alternative energies uh, alternative energy production and power production. We're seeing the same revolution in cars and, and so many other industries, trains. They're just, a, I think the entire world is looking at getting away from fossil fuels and seeing what 
how are the all of these industries are going to be sustainable into the 2030s 40s 50s and on um, so i think aviation is just on the same track as all these other industries that's my opinion fair point yeah no it's it's it's, it's a valid point part of me just i love a list of the, the green stuff i love you know we've all got to be eco and, mm. and things have got to get obviously a lot more um, um healthier than what they are currently in the air as such and what have you but part of me just misses that that look of a of a 707 taken off with four of those Pratt & Whitney JT8Ds leaving a, a plume of black smoke <laughs> as they take off. I, I don't know. Is that just, the coal? Is just, it? Yeah. Is that the yeah. coal that they use? Just doing yeah. your part for the environment. Yeah, absolutely. I know. <laughs> anyway, moving on to the next story. Armando, this is a mega story. Yeah, talking about innovations in aviation, let's partake a little bit in the festoon language of The Guardian. Uh, <laughs> Defying gravity as they hover over water before zipping across mountain landscapes and landing with pinpoint accuracy, the jet suit paramedic could soon form part of what could be an extraordinary new service being trialed in the Lake District of the UK. If given the green light by ambulance service chiefs, the paramedic powered by lightweight jetpacks would flit across treacherous terrain within minutes to reach stranded casualties. In an awe-inspiring test flight, inventor Richard Browning, looking distinctly like Marvel's Iron Man, put the suit <laughs> through its paces on the Langdale Pikes. Browning could be seen shooting across the grassy knolls at heights between three and six meters, it's not very high, uh, in search of a party of walkers simulating a casualty scenario. Within minutes, the woman and young girl had been located in a search that would normally have taken rescuers more than an hour on foot. The groundbreaking exercise was a culmination of a year-long discussion between the ambulance charity, the Great North Air Ambulance Service, and Gravity Industries. Andy Mawson, director, and a director of operations and a paramedic, uh, identified the lakes as a possible location for a jet suit paramedic after hearing of Browning's work and studying the charity's own call-out data. He said it showed dozens of patients every month uh, within the complex, but relatively small geographical footprint of the lakes. Uh, we could see the need. What we didn't know for sure is how that this would work in practice. Well, we've seen it now and it is quite honestly awesome. Mawson said that the exercise had demonstrated the huge potential of utilizing jet suits to cover, to deliver critical care services with an emergency medic wearing a suit, uh, able to scale the 3,117 po uh, peak foot peak of Helvellyn, England's uh, third highest mountain in just eight minutes. Uh, pretty cool. Matt's uh, playing out the video there. I believe we have reached the Iron Man age in aviation. <laughs> now, now, you, so many comments in yeah, the chat room, Matt. Indeed, so not, many not, all, not all great, uh, it has to be said. Uh, so uh, let me just see if I can whiz my way through this. I mean, Tony, first of all, is absolutely convinced that this is a publicity stunt. I suspect he might be uh, true here. Lane Street is saying going to need uh, medics to fix the medics that crashed the jetpack. Well, I think that's a good point. Um, it's uh, Again, Stephen's saying, or oh, they could have just sent up the drone, essentially, which is the one that's following the guy with the jetpack in the first place. Uh, Richard Adams <laughs> makes a great point here. A great point here, actually. It's a handy way to burn off the heather on the grouse moors. I mean, genuinely, the heat there, I mean, you couldn't use this in the height of summer, could you? Because of the the risk, if you like, to um, things uh, being damaged. Do you know what I mean? It's that whole, you know, because you could so easily start a fire with that. Well, if you can't use it in the summer because you're going to start a fire, you can't use it in the winter because as Lane Street offers up in the chat room, is he actually instrument rated? Because I've flown in the lakes in the winter and it's pretty cloudy all the time. <laughs> Lane, Lane Street says, I don't see his doctoring equipment. Uh, no, good point. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> He's got his brain. Well, I like in the video, I, I know we're being slightly pessimistic about this, but I like in the video that he gets there, he gets to the patients and then calls in a helicopter. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I suppose, I suppose you could argue here that what you, what, what you are doing essentially is you are getting help to where it needs to be, you know, because presumably, it's, I, we can't see it in the video here, but I presume he will have some kind of, you know, first aid or whatever. So he would be at least able to um, stabilize a, a patient while you were waiting for the traditional 
um, methods of getting so I mean it's why uh, in a lot of cities you've got the the bicycles isn't it where the bicycle paramedic comes to you and often gets to you long before um, an ambulance will because they can zip through traffic and all that kind of thing so it's 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 an interesting sort of way of getting the thing and also you could have a defib uh, unit that's attached to uh, to him so you you know there's there's a lot of things that just getting there I mean there are concerns obviously with the extreme heat and you know dry you know land and stuff but uh, it's it's a great bit of kit it's got jet jetpack bits and stuff like that it's amazing mm. but come on guys it's got flashing LEDs yeah uh, Jacob Darlington, <laughs> Darlington back yeah flashing LEDs on his arm there we go Jacob Darling says the Dr. Iron Man I think that's my favorite comment so far uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I love the part of the video that shows him flying over a, a lake and you just yeah. think to yourself oh uh, just, just don't let the engines fire. Right no, well, now. no, indeed. <laughs> well, yeah. that's. I, I feel like him flying over a lake is like me playing golf with a pond between me and the hole, which is, <laughs> man, it's only a hundred feet, but I'm going to get it in the water yeah, every absolutely. single time. <laughs> Easily, easy peasy. Uh, Richard Adams is saying at least he could make them a nice, you know, restorative hot brew while they wait for the helicopter. Good point. Good point, Wayne. Uh, uh, I love it. All of your paramedics <laughs> in the Lake District are not going to be sponsored by Red Bull. Lovely, yes, because, yes, apparently it gives you wings. There we are. Uh, anyway, that's, uh, that's quite enough of that. There we are. We'll go back to, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll leave that for now. There we are. So <laughs> that is where we bring the commercial segment to a close. It's been a good commercial segment this week, guys. Well done. And uh, we're going to hand things over for the next part of the show to Armando to introduce. Yeah, if you guys are ready, we always have just enough time to cover a couple military stories. So if uh, Matt, if you're ready, hit the button. Indeed. All right, guys, so this first story comes to us uh, kind of a hodgepodge of stories. It's a, still a developing story as, we, uh, as we'll see over the next couple of days what comes out of this. But the first part of it comes from the Daily Mail, uh, alarming audio from a stricken air tanker which collided with a military fighter jet in California reveals how the crew reported having two engines out and that they were leaking fuel and likely on fire. The tanker came down in a field, but the eight crew members all escaped unhurt. Uh, the other aircraft, an F-35B, uh, the pilot ejected and is being treated for injuries after he uh, landed back on the ground. So there is an audio recording posted on live ATC, and it reveals how the tanker, flying with the call sign Raider 50, raised the alarm with LA Air Traffic Control Center uh, in Palmdale, California. The Raider crew, crew replied, we are declaring an emergency. We still have partial control of the aircraft. Two engines out. We are aiming towards... And then the transmission from the tanker cuts out. The LA controllers then try to make contact again, while another voice reports a plume of black smoke from the time that the emergency was reported. Another person says that the impact was prior to his last transmission, suggesting that the smoke was not actually from the moment the tanker hit the field. LA Center, the air traffic control center, then appears to reestablish contract contact with uh, the Raider uh, before the tanker actually came down to the ground, although the crew could not be heard before the recording, uh, the full recording cut out. Um, they, the, uh, you can find it on YouTube already, but uh, there's a, a part of it where they're saying LA Center, LA Center, Raider 50 declaring an emergency mid-air collision with Volt 93. Two engines out, leaking fuel, likely on fire, emergency descent at this time, Raider 50. Um, again, you know, as we mentioned so many times, the the uh, crew just appears very calm and like they're just responding to the emergency in accordance with their training. Um, but the the LA center seemed to be a little bit confused, asking, "You said you were going down now," which is always interesting. Um, they uh, confirmed that, and then the tanker ended up land doing an emergency landing. Um, and putting it down in a field. So the Marine Corps, the U.S. Marine Corps, confirmed the collision uh, occurred during a refueling operation. Um, that's, you know, we've talked about that. You guys know what it, what it is. Um, the KC-130 uh, Juliet, or KC-130J, is on the deck in the vicinity in the of Thermal Airport. Um, th so this goes on. I found another article in the Journal, journal Times, which is a, a local newspaper, uh, where aviation safety consultant and retired Marine Corps Colonel Pete Field 
uh, who was a former director of the Naval Test Pilot School, uh, agreed that uh, he, he says the he thinks that the KC-130 crew did a masterful job of airmanship getting that aircraft down. Uh, the An aircraft this size, especially a KC-130, can carry up to 60,000 pounds of fuel. Uh, so the military said that the cause of the collision is under investigation. They wouldn't discuss the damage to the aircraft or other details. Now, um, there are some photos of this, uh, at least of the, um, the KC-130 that are publicly, I think Matt played them out there, uh, but it shows that the, the tanker at least had damage to the propeller blades. It was leaking fuel once it uh, belly landed uh, in that field. Uh, and then there was another video of the F-35 um, going down into, you know, somewhere in the sort of uh, remote California um, desert. Yeah, you know, Matt's got the pictures up right now. Now, now again, all of the crew are safe. And uh, at this point, it, it would just be speculation as to what happened, but there is a likely, especially from the damage that is visible uh, on the C-130 that, that it might have been a, an, an overtake or something gone wrong in the approach from, from a contact position into the, into the refueling position. Um, it looks like, like the F-35 might have clipped the, the wing. It, it, it looks like one of the, the refueling pods has fallen off the aircraft and it's just pouring out gas from the fuel tanks. Um, so we'll see. Uh, we'll see what happens with this. It was, uh, by all accounts, it was a clear day. It was uh, not a cloud in the sky and it was a, a routine mission. So, um, you know, I, I'm just glad that all of the crew are safe. And, and like the Colonel said, just a masterful job by the C-130 crew getting that airplane down. Yeah, just like judging by the pictures I'm under, not only did they lose two engines, but it looks like they might have lost a third as well with the prop damage on the number two uh, inboard engine on that hurt. Yeah, it looks like at least number one and two, and then the uh, the fuel pod, the refueling pod, mm. and the and the drogue assembly are, are missing from that left wing, so mm. we'll see. So the next story uh, is on the aviationist.com website, and Raphael Sonic Boom uh, during intercept shakes Paris and disrupts French Open tennis match. Oh dear. Uh, an almost routine intercept by a French Air Force Raphael made the news on September the 30th after uh, the loud sonic boom of the flying jet. Uh, at supersonic speed was heard all over Paris and neighboring suburbs. The French fighter from BA113 Saint Désir was responding to a comm loss event after a, sim a civilian Embraer ERJ145 flying from Bièvre to Saint Brie had lost radio contact with air traffic control agencies. The Raphael was already in flight to intercept a Falcon 50 when the CDAOA, or Commandement de la Défense Aérienne des de Operations Aériennes, Air Defense and Operations Command, based at Lyon Manverdon, retasked it to intercept the ERJ 145. No words. The French Literally jet no went words. supersonic <laughs> at 11.42 when it was flying about 33,000 feet over the eastern part of Paris. The atmospheric conditions caused the sonic boom to be quite strong, rattling Parisians already on the edge after a knife attack outside a former office of the satirical weekly Charlie Hedvo last week, and that the government was called to as an act of terror. The loud bang also forced the players, oh dear, at the French Open tennis tournament to halt for a while, judging, uh, the, uh, judging the sound which resembled an explosion. Dealing with sonic booms generated by interceptors on QRA uh, missions, they are nothing special. Fighters need to intercept the civilian aircraft experiencing a loss of communication in the shortest time possible to reach their target. They can be cleared to perform supersonic intercept braking, the same barrier in the process, and supersonic intercepts are routine, they say, uh, when needed all around the world. However, depending on the time or day or the region or period, they can send the local media into a frame especially after emergency agencies telephone switchboards start receiving reports of large bangs or explosions. 
Although it's often referred to as the breaking the sound barrier, the sonic boom is a continuous effect that occurs when the aircraft is traveling at supersonic speeds and not only when it accelerates through Mach 1. Now, Armando, you've got a bit to add to this. Yeah, so talking about sonic booms, it's, it's when an aircraft is flying, it's creating a series of pressure waves in front of the aircraft and behind it. These waves are usually traveling at the speed of sound, and as the speed of the object increases past that, those waves are compressed and eventually merge into a single shock wave. So that shock, due to the quick jump between the low pressure and low temperature supersonic airflow zone to a high pressure, high temperature subsonic speed zone, is actually perceived as uh, a loud bang by the human ear. So depending on several factors, an observer can hear a double bang sometimes when the initial uh, pressure rise reaches an observer and the other pressure returns back to normal. So uh, I love that they said this is a perfectly normal event. I would beg to differ. I think if you're standing in, this, in the streets of Paris and you, see, you hear a, a massive boom and some car windows and stuff may get rattled, uh, I think it would probably catch your attention, wouldn't it? Definitely, especially if you're on the top of the Eiffel Tower at the time. Yeah, that would be a <laughs> pretty fun sight to see, actually, from the top of the Eiffel Tower is a, yeah. a Rafale just booming across the sky. As you do, literally. I, I, I'm sorry, I've, I just managed to get the picture up there. There you are, of, of the sonic boom and, and uh, the, the effect it has. Look, it's, it's, uh, it's quite a disturbance in the force, isn't it? Science. <laughs> the force is strong with that one. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'd like to be able to sit here and go, yeah, I understood everything you two just said, but I, I didn't. Uh <laughs> <laughs> well, I think most more importantly, it shows that the French uh, Air Force is, is ready to respond at a moment's notice mm. when, when things goes wrong. And, you know, I think that's just a, another thing, uh, another sign of the times is that all of these aircraft are, are on standby and ready to go uh, at any given time. And next week on P2K, we'll be discussing warp field theory with Zephyr Cochran. Right, right. Well, yes, please, please line that up. I'll enjoy that immensely. Uh, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Armando, thank you very much for those uh, stories. It's, uh, it's. Uh, I, I'm, it, I learned so much on this, really, because as I say, I'm the first to admit that I don't know a great deal about about military. But uh, I mean, some of the stories that you've been picking of late have been genuinely really interesting. So, thank you very much for that. Well, if we can just get one more person in the world to like military aviation, then I've I done well, my no, job. steady. Oh, I didn't say I John liked it. Jonathan I, Warner. <laughs> Jonathan Warner has appeared in the chat room. Has so, he? oh, right. just in time for us to finish. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> and Graham Haley. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, right. So, what does he say? He says, uh, "Sorry, Graham Haley." Says Matt. Jet goes fast, makes loud bang. Fair point. Yep. I, I, th <laughs> I think that was uh, that's essentially that's military covered, right? Yeah. Jet goes fast, makes loud. Yeah, bang. Makes you, loud can, bang. you can make a bang so many ways in a military jet. Right, okay, we'll gloss over That's that. That's what and she move said. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> lovely family show, ladies and gentlemen. Family show. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so moving swiftly on to the next yes, part of the show. Yes. Do, do, do you know what? It's like, it was it two two paragraphs there? As I say, Graham Haley, you know, nailed it in one sentence. Uh, well done. Do well carry done, on. Sir. Yeah. So moving on to the next part of the show, and uh, well, here's a real treat. Uh, as always, we like to give you a real treat on the show, and uh, this was an interview that airline pilot guy played out as an audio only one earlier this year. But we're pleased to say we have edited all the video parts of it together so that we can bring it to you here on PTUK. So Ian, here we go with uh, Ian Palmer's interview. This is part four, so just a quick one. Ian Palmer is an accomplished musician. He first began to play drums at the age of nine, inspired by his two uncles who also played drums, Steve and Carl Palmer, as in Emerson, Lake and Palmer. Ian has also been a first officer for a number of airlines, the most recent one being Acme Red. He is also an incredible uh, storyteller and tells a story about his life as an aviator, but also about the immense difficulties he faced personally. He flew with Captain Nick on a, a couple of sectors, and it's Nick himself that presents uh, the series that we've been playing out of these four interviews with Ian. And we want to say a big thanks as well to both of these gentlemen for providing the original material. And... Uh, this is the last part of the series. This is part number four. So let's have a look and listen. Ian, lovely to see you again. Thanks very much uh, indeed for joining me for what I think will probably be our final interview. 
Well, it's a priv it's a privilege. It's a real pleasure. Thanks, Nick. Brilliant. Just to remind you, uh, we finished up last time uh, with you very much in the driving seat with regards to your drinking problem, but mm. now facing a, another problem, possibly even more serious. Can you talk us through that? Of course. So, as you, as you said, the alcohol situation, to all intents and purposes now, was I have a program of recovery. So, and I'm enjoying it, and life is, life is good. Uh, however, I then went on a trip to Barbados, and I remember flying over thinking, yeah, all's good. We're gonna go to uh, sit on the beach for a little while. I think I had a simulator session coming up, and I was gonna do a bit of studying uh, for that one. And I remember, flying the approach and it was, uh, it was a beautiful day there as it usually is a few CBs around in the afternoon but you know nothing untowards landing on the easterly runway there we get onto the ILS and it felt a bit hot and clammy didn't feel particularly great didn't say anything and this was one of the first times I'd flown the Airbus A330 previous I'd do, I was making the transition from the A340 so we landed the aeroplane and as soon as we touched down, I have to say it wasn't a heavy landing, but I saw two runways and also the world went at a sort of a slight angle and I naturally instinctively pressed the rudder pedal to go towards what I thought was the runway and I would the, uh, the my colleague at the time said, whoa, I have control, took control of the aeroplane, stopped the aeroplane, pulled off the runway and uh, said, are you okay? And I was picked up the gash bag off the seat and I was violently sick. And uh, oh, wow. it was so hot and clammy there when we landed as well. It's hot and clammy, but it's so hot that uh, as we pulled on to stand, um, my friend who I was flying with, he was like gagging as well. He was he was going to be sick because of the smell. It was awful. It was horrible. So um, anyway, we pulled on to stand. We let the cabin crew know that, or he let the cabin crew know that I wasn't very well. It was decided to disembark the passengers, first of all. We then got um, some medical assistance and I was really, really, really ill. Um, I hung around, had a glass of water and bit, but slowly over the course of about an hour, it all started to, I think the crew went to the hotel on the crew bus and myself and the captain stayed behind in a taxi. I went in the taxi um, a little when I felt a bit better, but he was really concerned about me and really looked after me. And I went to the hotel and it was decided that they couldn't do really do anything for me. But what had actually happened? Well, they flew me, I flew back to London. I then went to see the G my GP who said, well, that's, and it, I felt better by this stage. I, I, it kind of, the, I guess the double vision uh, hung around for a, you know, maybe a day or so, uh, and then it subsided. So I was fine by the time I got home. I saw my GP, he said, let's, I'm going to send you to a specialist. Now, what you have to bear in mind, this is the second time that I'd had an experience like this. Oh, really? Yeah, so what had happened was, it turns out that I had a 20 millimeter benign tumor in the midbrain. So anyone that knows about sort of geography of the head, if you like, um, this tumor was lying in the third ventricle very close to the pineal gland and i believe it was attached to the cerebellum uh, the back of the head so whilst the tumor itself was a very very nice tumor in as much as it grew very slowly they could contain it you can monitor it it's very difficult to get to because it required you to either go through the top of the head here which if you went through the top of my head straight down between both sides of the brain then the chances of getting epilepsy, I would have said, were probably a million percent. Um, so, of course, that's not really going to work for flying. Um, but happily, the tumour was below the ear line. So the good news there is that there was no chance of epilepsy. Um, so my, it's become a friend now, Professor Cruikshank, went into my head, through the back of my head, over the top of the cerebellum, and into the third ventricle that way, and removed... Um, well, basically the upshot of it was, is that I went for surgery to remove a brain tumor. Now, when I got my initial class one medical at the start of my flying career, um, this was also something that was identified then. Oh, so really? it was always something which could potentially come back. And I remember then that it was all 
came from the fact that I'd had an audiogram as part of the initial class one medical and I'd lost a little bit of hearing in my right ear. So I was sent for a uh, basically seeing an ear, nose and throat specialist who said to me, oh, you need to have an MRI scan, but I think it's a bit of a waste of time because you're a drummer and it's going to be noise induced hearing loss. So this was actually identified as something which perhaps I was born with. So this tumour was removed in 2000 before I went to college uh, to do my flying career as one of the requirements. And then it came back 15 years later on this flight uh, it had been growing slowly, but it had grown to the point where the basically the optic, optic nerve was being distorted from the inside, which is where this double vision situation came from, or it had some effects on that. Now, I'm not a doctor, I don't know the ins and outs of it, but it was pretty, um, pretty complicated to, to get to it. So I'd be etern eternally grateful to Professor Cruikshank, and I'm now not only on the recovery side of the uh, alcoholic condition, but I'm now involved um, with people recovering from brain tumors and part of a brain tumor charity now which um, is very close to my um, close to my head so well that's brilliant now I gather that the operation went quite well but you actually had some complications after yeah so the the operation was uh, Professor Cruikshank said to me at the initial consultation, he said, Ian, um, we can remove this. Now, the, the clever thing here was that Professor Cruikshank is on the advisory board for the CAA and actually the DVLA for car licensing. But he's really involved with the CAA. So he had sort of allayed their fears and said, no, we can get to it. We can sort it out. Don't worry about it. It's not a career ending issue. This is a benign tumor that we can remove and if all goes well Ian can resume his flying career so that was always the plan but what Brilliant. he did say to me was that Ian you're in for turbulent water with this situation and this is not something which is going to be pleasant it's not going to be a walk in the park and it really wasn't because I had to learn to walk again I had to learn to effectively write well my writing has changed as a result of this now some of the fine movement um, so but it's effectively now the upshot of that is that you know I've worked really hard I had two years off work one year to recover and what I will say is that the initial surgery whilst it seemed to go okay I got to the point in hospital seven days after surgery where my brain started to swell and I started to lose my vision. I started to lose um, sense of touch. So all of my senses were breaking down here. So Professor Cruikshank came back very quickly, but the person who helped me initially was a respiratory physio. And that respiratory physio is Kirsty, who is now my fiance. <laughs> it's a lovely story. Wow, isn't um, that brilliant? Yeah, but I, I will say that there was no sort of uh, medical um, rules broken there and as much as I did contact her on Facebook four months after I left hospital but um, anyway we sort of went from there so yeah we now share a house on the outskirts of London um, which is which is fantastic so Kirsty really helped me through that and of course that's why she never knew anything about my past regarding any sort of alcohol or, or issues there but what this really does it really again it really focused me on what's important in life and I remember with my musical career, um, just before this surgery, I played a concert with one of my absolute heroes. And this person's name is Steve Gadd, who's one of the finest drummers in the world. He's probably the most influential drummer ever. Um, he's played with lots of uh, famous people. He plays regularly now with James Taylor and Eric Clapton. And I remember Steve saying to me, um, Ian, what's the most important thing? And I said, well, that's my flying career, because that's where it's my income. He said, no. So I thought, okay, it's probably a test here. It must be my musical career. That's my most important thing. He said, no. The most important thing is don't drink. Wow. The most important thing is don't drink. If you don't drink, everything will be fine. And how right he was, because he's, has, it's no secret, but he's been through a similar uh, path to me, a similar experience. So the brain surgery and the experience of losing my parents and what all that culminated in really does change your life and it's made me not just serious about life it's made me extremely serious about life in a very positive way i'm sure 
Absolutely, absolutely. And I've gone on now to yeah, music is great. I can now return to my musical career. Oh, that's fantastic. In, Tell me more about that. Yeah, well, that's happening in and around my um, my flying. So I had a band which um, achieved um, a, a, some success, a band called The Ghosts, which was a band which I'd put together and uh, was involved in the formation of that band. It was my idea. And that had a, a single which uh, went to number eight in the British charts. Oh, brilliant. Which was, uh, which was amazing. And um, most recently, I have... Um, been involved with recording music for films and I've been involved with the soundtracking of uh, Tomb Raider um, so then I, this was a basically an album which has been recorded for Peter Connolly who was the original writer of the Tomb Raider soundtracks um, so this is for the forthcoming uh, movie but it's also a CD and it's also, you can listen to it on Spotify. It's called uh, Tomb, Raider, Tomb Raider, a Dark Angel Symphony. That's brilliant. Uh, and uh, of course, there is a, the, the, fact, the brilliant, um, I use that word way too much, I'm sorry, um, concert that you hold annually, uh, The World's Greatest Drummers. Yeah, The World's Greatest Drummer. And as you can see, this was a name that I came up with pre coming into recovery and I was certainly not alluding to myself as the world's greatest drummer <laughs> but actually what it was is a tribute to somebody known as the world's greatest drummer and or who was known as the world's greatest drummer and that was Buddy Rich so it's grown and grown this concert and we've done 10 of these concerts now over the last well, 14, 13, 14 years, and everyone has been just, just amazing. And what happens is we have a full big band, which is largely members of the BBC Radio Big Band, and we get together in a beautiful theatre. The last concert was held at the Derngate Theatre in Northampton, which holds around 900 people. Yeah. And we had um, to this concert that I was referring to with Steve Gadd. That was probably my proudest moment on stage because Steve is someone that I've really looked up to since I was a child as a musician, since I was in well, my early teens at least. And uh, the opportunity to play alongside Steve was amazing. But then there's also my friend Steve White, who performs with us, who maybe some of the listeners or um, viewers will know Steve through his work with Paul Weller. And uh, he brother played with the um, band Oasis. Brilliant. Uh, so yes, he's in a different style. Yeah, and then there was also Peter, Pete Cater, who is my dear friend, who actually, um, strangely enough, was born uh, about a mile away from where I was born in Sutton Coalfield. Oh, small and, world. But, yeah, but Pete has gone on to be um, probably the, the best known big band drummer in, in Europe. And uh, he's in great demand as a teacher and as always we could say an educator and, uh, and a session musician. So your yeah, life is really good now. Life is very different to, you know, those dark days. And um, as I, you know, as I say then, you know, my worst, my worst days sober are infinitely better than my best days drinking. <laughs> That's fantastic to hear. And your aviation career continues to blossom. Uh, you're in a yeah. training role now, aren't you? Yeah, so it's gone, it's, it's gone from strength to strength. And this is not something that I've acti actively pushed. But one of the things, you know, I guess this is the, the perfectionist streak that we all tend to have as aviators. But I had uh, applied for a job as what we call a training first officer. And it's, you know, it's lovely to stand in front of people, impart knowledge. And, and one of the things this really does is forces you to really know your subject as well. And also in the course of teaching, people ask you questions. So it does encourage you to, uh, to, to know more about what you're talking about. So from there, I was then offered the opportunity to become a, an Airbus A330 TRI tight rating instructor. So now I run simulator sessions for crews within my company. And it's just, again, that's a really privileged position because you're sitting behind pilots now watching them. And, you know, as we say, we're politely throwing the hand grenades in and letting them deal with it. And it's interesting to see the different approaches. And that is the privileged seat where you can learn such a lot. So the last, uh, the last thing I did within my airline was I went for uh, what we call the cap, the dreaded cap. 
which stands for Command Assessment Process. And this was a, it's probably the most stressful, apart from the uh, instrument rating test, this is probably the most stressful um, stressful test that I've ever done. And what happened was I showed up there, they gave me uh, next to no fuel, they put me in the simulator next to no fuel, put me in a holding pattern near New York's Kennedy Airport, going round and round in circles, they told me that Kennedy Airport is closed until further notice. But the weather was fine, apart from the fact that it was, the wind was uh, slightly breezy at 150, it's uh, 30 gusting 35. Um, so we were landing on the VOR approach onto runway 22 left. But we're going around the hold, not knowing when Kennedy was going to open. But that didn't matter because the cabin crew, the uh, purser, rang up and said, um, Ian, um, we've got a problem. Uh, one of the passengers has gone into cardiac arrest. Uh, of course, this is all simulated, but this is the sort of pressure that they put you under. So I thought, flipping out, okay, so I'm watching this fuel drain away. So, okay, well, mayday, 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 let's go and fly. We've got to fly the approach. So we sort the airplane out. We're ready for the approach. But as soon as I requested for the first stage of flap, uh, we lost uh, on the air, in Airbus what we, we call it the green hydraulic system. Mm. So we lost all the fluid from the green hydraulic system, which then meant we had to break off the approach, have to go through all of the um, app cockpit procedures. And it was really one of those. Are we going to succumb to the pressure of the fact that a passenger is having a heart attack and put another 200 passengers under risk? you know, with flying a gash approach, or am I going to say no, I'm going to take the time and sort this out. Also mindful of the fact that the fuel is draining away very quickly. So anyway, the upshot was that, um, yeah, I flew an approach onto an inter relatively interwind runway onto one three left and ILS, and they stopped it just short of the touchdown point and said, yeah, congratulations. So from there on, they invite you to do an interview. The interview was um, well, that was pretty difficult as well. They ask you to go through a flight from A to B. You get on the aeroplane. This happens. What are you going to do? You have this uh, MEL uh, item to look at before you can dispatch. What are you going to do? Okay, so you have this item. You have some icing conditions. You taxi out. Okay, you're now below uh, the minimum fuel for takeoff. What are you going to do? Okay, you get airborne. You lose a navigation system. What are you going to do? So is that sort of scenario uh, or several scenarios um, but it's really testing um, so that was the last thing I did so I'm just you know, hoping now at some point we get to do a, a command course and that will really be uh, the icing on the cake then to achieve my command to be a training pilot and I'll think look back and I'll think flipping out that was quite a rough bumpy road but the most important thing is we got there a rough, bumpy road would be one of the things I would attribute to your entire life. But uh, hopefully, and I, I say this with great humility, uh, I can see in you the qualities that will make it uh, smooth for the future. So thank you very much indeed mm. for uh, talking to us uh, today. I, I, I'm sure all our listeners would love to know how they can uh, find some more information about you uh, and particularly your music. In uh, how could they do that? Absolutely. So, the, of course, being a musician, the social media thing is, is very active. So on Instagram, you can find me at Ian Palmer Drums. At Twitter, it's also Ian Palmer Drums. And I have a Facebook, um, two Facebook pages, my personal one, Ian Palmer Drums, and also an artist page, which is Ian Palmer Drummer. And of course, there's also my own website, um, ianpalmer.com. Well, I'm sure they'll find something there uh, to uh, enjoy, uh, and I really look forward to visiting them uh, all myself. Um, finally, um, before I say goodbye, and this is for our PTUK listeners, um, given the opportunity to fly any aircraft, past or present, any type at all, um, what would you choose to fly? I suspect that this question may be coming along, and I've had a... Do you know what? There's... I'm going to have to say there's two aeroplanes now for two different reasons. When I was very young, I used to love those aeroplane disaster movies. And it was always the Boeing 747. And I remember as a young child going on an aeroplane, flying back from uh, Orlando International, back into to London. And I remember looking at this cockpit, seeing the pilots there ready for the night flight of this Boeing 747, I just remember that's another one of those moments where I thought I'd love to be doing that. And that was one of those defining moments. So I think really, uh, it will never happen now. Um, of course, 
a total Airbus convert, as I know you were, Nick. But um, I will have to say, probably for those sentimental reasons, the Boeing 747. But that being said, there is another one. And I don't know if I can admit this, actually, to you now. It's, it's marginally embarrassing amongst fellow aviators. <laughs> but I used to love... Um, I love that film Top Gun. <laughs> so ah, yes. I love that film Top Gun. And I think one of the most beautiful, beautiful looking aeroplanes of all time was the F-14 Tomcat. Well, I, I, I have to love, agree. Superb looking machine. And I'd love to have um, had the opportunity to fly one of those. I don't really fancy myself as Maverick or Iceman, but nevertheless, I would love to have sat in one of those aeroplanes and flown one of those. Well, that's brilliant. Thanks very much. Uh, so only remains for me to thank you very much indeed uh, for giving us your time uh, and being so open and honest uh, with us. It's been a remarkable story. And, uh, of course, from myself and all the listeners, we wish you all the good fortune in the rest of your life flying and music. Oh, thank you, Nick. It's my ple pleasure and it's great to speak to you. Thanks, thanks a lot for asking me along. I mean, what an incredible series. And and thank you so much to Nick as well for uh, asking that question that we always ask all of our Dropping the friends. question Absolutely. in. Absolutely. Very sneaky. I, I must admit, I didn't realise he'd done that. So that was a very pleasant surprise. <laughs> no, well done for that. Thanks. Uh, big thanks to uh, to Nick and Ian, obviously, for that. It's been it's been a great little series. I know it's been definitely well received by um, by all the listeners as well. Mm, so absolutely, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah and thanks, thanks to Nev also for stitching it all together. Obviously, because he received it in a a big pile of wonderful files uh, and stitched it all together so expertly. So thank you to Nev for all his hard work, as always. Definitely, definitely. So <laughs> wrapping up. Time. Uh, Wrapping up time, yeah. So we are going to uh, start to wrap up the show now. So if I can bring up, here we go, bring up the show notes. There we go. So social media links. Uh, actually, We have we some, yes, links? that's yeah. true. Yeah. So if you want to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, search for us if you haven't already done so, Plane Talking UK. Don't forget as well, if you want to get your picture, your aviation-related picture on that beautiful green screen behind Matt in the studio, you can WhatsApp your pictures to plus four four. Or seven five seven two two four nine one six six, or you can email your pictures to podcast at plain talking uk dot com. Don't forget to check out our website, all the w's dot plain talking uk dot com. Loads of links and bits and pieces to look at on there, including our store where you can grab yourself one of our shiny PTUK coffee slash tea mugs, or gin or whiskey or whatever you want to put in the mugs. <laughs> And you can also find yourself one of our glorious PTUK, if you haven't already got one, our lovely soft cotton, 100% cotton PTUK t-shirts with the embroidered PTUK logo on and the print on the back as well. And also on there, you'll find the links if you want to become a patron of the show and uh, be a part of the show, a big part of the show, helping to do everything and push everything through the show each week. You can click on the Patreon link and become a patron. And if you just want to make a one-time donation, if you mysteriously found that dollar or pound <laughs> behind the sofa, you can uh, do that through the PayPal link on the website as well on there. And don't forget as well to check out uh, our guest tonight, Gemma Brazier, on the social media, on Instagram, if you look up Crew Businesses, and also on the Facebook site as well, Not Just Crew page. Uh, we're going to put all the links to her social medias on the show notes. Mm -hmm. So if you want to find out more about her social medias, you can click on our show notes and all the links will be on there. Also, don't forget to check out Ian Palmer on Instagram. You can find him, Ian Palmer Drums, on Instagram and on Twitter, Ian Palmer Drummer. And also, if you want to check out his website, it's all the W's dot Ian Palmer dot com on there. So, guys, what is everyone up to this week? Armando, we'll start with you. Well, guys, we've been teasing at it for a couple weeks now, but I think it's safe to say it's official. Uh, I will no longer be working for my airline. <gasps> so this, I did not, I did not get furloughed. Uh, I actually decided to take a different job opportunity, and I know that's kind of a funny thing to do when there's so many people that are about <laughs> to be furloughed uh, or were this, you know, this week. Um, the aviation industry is is a funny old old place, but 
I actually had a local company recruit me and um, I will be getting the opportunity to fly uh, a very unique airplane. So I'll be doing some airborne surveys, some airborne telemetry and some hyperspectral imagery from a, a, a Jetstream 41 and a Basler turbine DC-3. So uh, I will be moving from the platypus, uh, or sorry, the Pilatus uh, over to a DC-3, <laughs> which is one of my dream aircraft. And that's really the reason that, that I had to take a, this uh, Armando, opportunity. Armando, this ain't just any DC-3, is it? Well, no, it's, it is a turbine DC-3. So it's, mm. it's basically their zero-timed aircraft uh, uh, refurbished by the Basler company up in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Um, it is a BT-67, like Lane Street says in the chat room. Um, but uh, yeah, just a fantastic airplane. And again, I, it's just a, a plane that I've dreamt about since I was a kid. Uh, growing up in Puerto Rico, I remember the Toll Air cargo DC-3s uh, island hopping coming back into San Juan. So this company found me and, and it's local. I'll get a lot more time at home and just going out on the road uh, you know, for a few weeks at a time, a couple of times a year and, uh, and sort of managing their aviation department. So uh, I'm really excited to do that. And I'm, I'm incredibly grateful to all of you that figured out what company I used to work for. Uh, but I'm, <laughs> I'm grateful to them for having given me the opportunity to transition out from the military into civilian aviation. And that was a uh, pretty big transition. You know, I, we've talked about it on the show and, and Nick talked about it when he went from military to civilian and uh, Jeff talked about it. But, uh, but for me, uh, this will be a, a nice opportunity to, uh, to um, kind of mix the two, a little bit of unique mission flying with, with civilian uh, flying. So there we go. Very, very, very can, exciting. Can we, can we just give a big round of applause, please, for Armando? Oh, um, I think so. Yeah, that's, that's very good. Absolutely. Yes. Scary, scary stuff, really. It's... Uh, very interesting. Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, uh, and the worst, the, the the only negative thing from our point of view is uh, the what you're actually doing. You're not allowed to talk to us about, which is soul destroying. But anyway. <laughs> 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 but I'm delighted you're play. You, you're going to be playing with one of your your all time favourite jets. That that's great news. Isn't so it? jealous. Yeah. So that's such an awesome aircraft. Yeah, honestly. very cool. Yeah, and and you said they 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 contacted you because of your appearances on Beats PTK. Oh, stop it! Yeah, yeah. honestly. So anybody that it? wants a new job in aviation, <laughs> no, come be no, a guest. No, no, no. Gemma, no. look, Gemma's moving on to better, like great things. And Nick, look, Nick had a, a terrible career in the airlines. Now he's going to go do some great things. No, I'm just kidding. Right, yeah, podcasting <laughs> being one of them. Okay, uh, uh, please, uh, please immediately unhear everything you've just listened to over the last about two minutes, uh, please. I think that's the thing. But anyway, um, it's safe to say there's an awful lot of love in the chat room for you, oh, Armando. Yeah. So thank you to uh, to you and congratulations. And hopefully it means we might be able to sort of see you a little bit more regularly. Uh, does that mean we're going to have to renegotiate the the contract with ne Nev now? <laughs> as long as Nev will take me, right? I, will, I would be more than happy to contribute <laughs> on the same shows. That He's on. Fantastic, absolutely. Now, ironically, you've you've just mentioned that, but of course, uh, whilst we've got Nev back uh, next week, but unfortunately, uh, contractual uh, requirements mean that you won't be here next week. <laughs> That's right. Until we until we renegotiate. Until you've renegotiated, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's uh, yeah a bit of a, a bit of a shame, but uh, hopefully you'll be back with us sort of the following week. All being well. Uh, we'll see. We'll see what the schedule holds. Okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely, yes. Yeah, Fingers we crossed. Might, we, uh, we, we can't really announce it yet because it, we, we, it's all a little bit um, yeah, up in the air. But we're, we've hopefully got a really special guest lined up for next week. Uh, hopefully. And uh, don't forget, obviously, as I say, um, my friend uh, Dan, we've got part two of the storm chasing chat that uh, we had with him to look forward to next week as well. I'm not uh, really doing a great deal this week. I'm sort of d doing what, what my mum likes to refer to as a work sandwich, uh, where I go and do a bit of school <laughs> runs morning and afternoon and then uh, do, do the other job in between. So, uh, uh, yes, all very interesting. I must admit, I'm a bit nervous doing it at the moment because there's been a bit of a rise, shall we say, in cases at a chicken factory not a million miles away from from where we where we are so um just hoping to sort of stay mm. covid free for the foreseeable frankly but uh, so that'll be mostly what i'm doing next week uh, bricking myself uh, is the short answer 
<laughs> and on that bombshell, I think it's time to wrap up. Yeah, uh, Carlos, what have you got in the in the schedule for next week? Oh, just quickly, I'm back at work. My boss is so pleased because he's missed right, me this week. So uh, nice I'll be, be back next week, Stuart. Don't <laughs> panic. I'll be back next week. So <laughs> that is where we are going to bring episode 338 of the Plain Talking UK podcast to a close. Thanks to everyone who's joined us in the YouTube chat room tonight, all the family. Massive thanks to you. Thank you so much, guys. You, we really have enjoyed having you in the chat room again tonight. And a big thanks as well to everyone who downloads the show as an audio podcast. So have a great weekend. So from me, Carlos here in my home studio, from Matt in the glorious P2K studios, from Armando in his studios over in the Carolinas. Have a great weekend. Take care, everyone. Stay safe. Goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye, everyone.